Hey everyone, good morning. Welcome to another live broadcast of the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devinder Hardwar. This morning I'm joined with our reviews editor, Sherlyn Lowe. Hey Sherlyn. Hello. Our mobile editor, our senior mobile editor, Chris Velasco. Hey Chris. Hi. And our podcast producer, Ben Elman. Howdy, Ben. Hello. Hello. It's a crowded morning because it's been a very, crowded. very busy news <laughs> week. Oh my God. There's just so much stuff happening. Um, so yeah, we will be talking a bit about Google I.O. on the high level, but I will say if you guys want more like drilled down analysis, be sure to check out Trillin and V's uh, post Google I.O. chat that's up on our YouTube channel right now too. So you could check that out. How are you guys doing? Exhausted. Yeah. Always, so. <laughs> we were talking about like I was mm -hmm. suggesting picks to Sherlyn because she was so burnt out. And I was like, maybe your pick should be sleep. We'll your see. Your pick should be sleep. Please rest, everybody. Um, v, I hope you are relaxed. And am I? Have I ever been relaxed? Stuff? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm constantly just like wired and on edge, which I don't oh, think will wow. be a surprise to, to, for anyone to actually hear. Oh boy. Uh, thank you, chat room, for joining us. We've got Mark Dell. I see Jonathan Anderson, Lev Gupta. A whole bunch of people Great this morning, exception. and people joined early too. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah, was good. Josh Sachdeva, which like that name just lives in my head for some reason. It, it feels good to say. <laughs> Great it's name, like, it really does. I I never saw the appeal of cellar door, but like there are other <laughs> things that have that, that just same. sound good and yeah, roll off the yeah, yeah. really well. Yeah, I love a good uh, and a good like. NPR type name too. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Josh Sachdeva is a great NPR great name. name. Great name. Um, let us let oh us know boy. how to get your names right. If there's any way to kind of pronounce it properly. It was, yeah, yeah, my yeah, inclination, yeah. my inclination is ch here might be a k sound, but it, it, could, it, be, could, be it could be a soft ch. Pratik Power, thank you. Hello. Um, we will, by here. the way, be also diving into the iPad Pro review that. Chris mm -hmm. wrote this week. I did the iMac M1 review. So we'll do that after Google I.O. And then there's, there's so, so much. much news. So much news. Y'all so <laughs> ain't, oh, ain't ready. We are not I ready for all this. Okay. Yeah. Are you guys, as always, folks, we are going to be recording the podcast. So we can't talk to you during our segments. We will take some audience Q&As between during breaks and stuff. And uh, Ben will be keeping an eye out for comments and questions. So just shoot them to him and you know shout out but be ready for the q and a's we can even show off some things although i don't know my my office is not in the best spot right now well yeah but we got a lot to show off we've got um some apple products and yep. some other stuff and yep. uh so it's gonna be fun but let's get to it let's get to it okay <clears throat> we're gonna start off the podcast proper what's up internet and welcome back to the engadget podcast i'm senior editor devendra hardwar I'm Reviews Editor Sherlyn Lowe. This week, it is all about Google I.O. 2021, and also a couple reviews from uh, from the latest Apple products. We've, we'll be chatting about the iPad Pro and the mm -hmm. iMac M1. As always, if you're enjoying the show, please be sure to subscribe to the Engadget Podcast on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes because I swear those little reviews and star ratings actually matter. And if you want to drop us a question, shoot us an email at podcast at Engadget.com. Let's just kick off with Google I.O. And joining us to talk about that is our senior mobile editor, Chris Velasco, who did all this with Sherlyn. Hello, Chris. Hi. How is it going? Hi, and uh, I will say up front to our listeners, uh, Chris and Sherlyn did a post IO recap that is up on our YouTube stream. Uh, we didn't have a chance to put that in the podcast channel, but it is worth listening to as well. But uh, yeah, let's talk about some high level stuff. So <laughs> what what was up with Google IO this year? I'm just wondering, like, what is your broad takeaway for both of you? My my main one, and, and let me, I don't mind, I don't know if we have the same thought, V, but uh -huh. my main takeaway is that like, since Google didn't have an I.O. last year and it did this year, there was news across all, like all of its ecosystem so much. This was a two hour long event and Google has made, you know, changes to so many things that it, it's, it almost bored us with some of the stuff because the early parts yeah. were very dry. <laughs> and then the meat and potatoes, Android and, and consumer software side of things were later in the show. So it, it I think... Google flex kind of the breadth of this like product portfolio at Google IO it just reminded mm -hmm. everyone like this is how much you know of your business we have business in and 
it's like you can't you just it's you sometimes can't escape you forget. Us. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to forget Google is in every facet of your life, but then oh, it's like man. and also no, future and facets, like, this like 3D meetings and whatnot. Mm. Uh, v, what did you think? Because you're also coming off of this from doing a lot of Apple stuff too. So you mm -hmm. have a good sense of how Apple and Google are doing and how they compare to each other. Yeah, I mean, that came up a lot sort of during mm -hmm. the conversations around uh, the event. You know, people were comparing the Google event to the way Apple sort of handles things, sort of critiquing one versus the other. And I don't, I mean, like this is a developer show. For people who aren't aware, Google I.O. is a developer-focused yes. show. There is like that beginning keynote where they sort of really <laughs> high level go through basically everything that they've been working on. And everything really feels like everything this time. But, mm -hmm. but after that, like this is a show meant for people who are getting down into the weeds and building apps and figuring out how best to create and deploy and manage their own software. So it's, it's, you we were left with a very palpable sense sort of halfway through that this mm -hmm. was very interesting, but kind of pie in the sky, maybe even <laughs> slightly boring stuff to some people, mm, but that is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just easy to forget. That's what IO was kind of always mm -hmm. like, they, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's smart home platform improvements, there's where stuff, there's assistant, there's quantum computing, but then also the more traditional stuff that you'd associate with Google. So Android, for example. Search. So very different than like an yeah. Apple media event, right? Which I think is very, uh, almost very commercial, like, and very slick in a way, this is a little more dev focused. I'll tell you guys, I've been watching a lot of uh, upfronts, which are the things media mm -hmm. companies do. So like Disney and Warner Media, it's the things they create to woo advertisers and to you know let all their partners know what they're up to. Um, this felt more like an upfront. It was more like, hey, we're Google, look at everything we're doing. Cause it's not strictly consumer. It didn't feel exactly developer focused either in a way, because when I think developer focused and boring, I think of like, Microsoft's build keynotes, which last over <laughs> two was, hours and is people coding truly. on stage. There's actual you know, like, coding on stage, yes. Coding on stage, like that is for developers. This felt like it was labor. They were moving from bit to bit. They just had a lot of little bits to do, but let's talk about some of the high level stuff. What is changing with Android? Um, it seems like they're finally going for a little bit more style, although I don't know, that, that seems uh, debatable. <laughs> It does seem like the biggest visual refresh in, right. I don't want to say years. I, I believe personally since like Android 10 or maybe even before, but V, you, I mean, you mm -hmm. followed Android a little more closely than I have. When did material design drop? Like when was that idea? What was, what was that? Like 2013, 14, mm -hmm. back when Matias 14, Duarte yeah. really material. started talking so about since yeah. then, yeah. 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 And it really just yeah. seems like they've taken the material kind of concept and just blown it open. For people mm -hmm. who didn't sort of see the show unfold, one of the big changes to Android 12 is the sort of, they've reshifted material design to this concept called Material U, which basically kind of builds off of their approach to sort of clean layered uh, design, but sort of added some really heavy customization effects. So once you set your wallpaper, for example, Android will be able to not just see what it is and sort of tune system colors uh, appropriately, you know, they'll, they'll look for sort of complementary colors or sure, sort of sure. what would look so like there are, and, and it does also seem like those changes uh, mm -hmm. sort of get tied to your Google account. So if you have a pixel and you've, you know, tricked it out just the way that you want it, that theming information stays mm -hmm. with your account. So when you get a new one, you're basically left with a device that looks a lot like your old one, which I thought was actually really cool. That's kind of cool. I, uh, the name, by the way, almost seems like a, like a threat. Like when they first <laughs> said it, <it's> like, <laughs> material you, okay? Which is, reminds me of like one of my favorite lines from like bad uh, 90s action movies, which is usually F me. No, 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 F you. <laughs> uh, and it feels just, just like that. Uh, material you, everybody. Uh, uh, I don't know. Like, what do you guys think about this design? It looks, there's a lot of rounded edges, but it also seems yeah. like baby's first, uh, you know, a bit. mobile mm -hmm. UI in a way. Like, it does not seem, it does not, it doesn't even seem like, I don't know. What do you guys think? Tell me about that. I, I, I've spent some time and I think V you yeah. have too with the Android 12 beta and uh, my, you know, the write up, uh, it's already live on our site if you want to go check it out for more detailed impressions. But I, I don't believe we've seen the full extent of it, at least in this right, beta. Right, and, right. uh, 
there's more what it is is i think a more cohesive more refined os with it mm-hmm. in addition to these like visual uh design changes so i'm i'm more looking forward to that because in some ways the android 11 os itself felt to me still like it was a beta there's some things that were just inconsistent mm-hmm. throughout like font sizes or like the notifications uh shade just wouldn't just didn't look right it looked like something out of a dev like devs toolbox or something meanwhile so far the android 12 beta looks cleaner it looks maybe it's just Mm -hmm. like my eyes adjusting to the difference probably but it's a little flatter in a way like the the way it looks it almost looks like uh the way some companies do digital signage or something like it is very like bold colors round designs big fonts which yeah it is more cohesive and almost flat in a way that that uh, uh like windows phone kind of was like the yeah. you know, it's, hmm. it's kind of blocky and it's not square it's not like sharp angles like yeah, it's that rounder for sure it's rounder um i don't know i i see it being I... a thing it almost seems like the interface from like a movie like her you know like a sci-fi movie <laughs> interface but it does seem yeah. simplified in a way which i'm not sure is part better. of it's just different yeah Part of it, in my opinion, one thing I noticed is that like the new notifications shape compared to Android 11, it, like the individual mm-hmm. cards for each alert, the color isn't as contrasty as the background it's on anymore. So it's not as different. It's actually like a lighter shade of white on top of a, like a more translucent white or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but that makes everything feel like less like there's so many different pieces flying around so it's right, like less right. cluttered looking i think that's part of the change here mm-hmm. um it is I, it's I sort think... of like somebody went to it's like when you hire an interior designer right you think you have a good design in your home and then you hire somebody to be like put everything in cute little boxes and nothing gets Marie out of Kondo? Its, space. it's very Marie <laughs> Kondo of android not even like she, she's all about removing things but hey yeah, yeah it, it is kind of like that um let me just see here and by the way listeners if you want to see an example of this thing in action check out Shrillin's piece about this android 12 beta but also if you check out this live stream she has been holding up the phone and doing cool stuff. So check that out <laughs> and there's a video YouTube coming channel. stay tuned there's a video there's coming a video coming that's all good is there anything like what else is coming to android because they they keep saying this is the biggest mm-hmm. operating system in the world you know they're really flexing their power what are what else do we have to look forward to besides material you I mean, V, go mm-hmm. ahead. No, I was just going to say that the one thing I was really hoping would wind up in this first sort of public beta build that I don't think is there, I haven't found it at least, yeah. is the sort of privacy dashboard. So yeah, it too. sort of it sort of it builds off of Google's idea of of digital well being to the point where you know some of the visuals from what we understand look the same. There's like the circular graph that just shows you your breakdown between, you know, in this case with the privacy dashboard, how frequently some apps require Mm -hmm. access to certain permissions. And that is to me a very powerful thing, right? Because I think everyone, because of the way apps will just sort of claim access to whatever you allow them to, even if you're aware of it or not, you know, because people are just sort of willing generally to hit, yes, I accept and just kind of go about their lives. Mm-hmm. Like these apps are accessing, they can access your camera, your cellular data, your identifiers, all of these things that people just do not think about. So having one place where mm-hmm. you can sort of manage and really kind of have a quick, relatively easy think about what should and should not have access to what at any given time, that's huge. Even if people don't always use it, having a tool that makes it easier for those who are inclined, which by the way, should be everybody, that that feels like a really big step forward. Yeah, one, one quick question we is... actually got, let me let me just quit, join in here because we got a comment from our YouTube chat. Mm-hmm. And if you join us live uh, Thursdays around 10 a.m. Eastern, you can per chance drop us some questions too it's from esky anderson who's asking could you talk more about low vision accessibility on android 12 he's uh they're visually impaired and they stick to apple because of the accessibility options do we hear anything about that with this version some of the changes coming to android include some accessibility improvements and i am Mm -hmm. actually trying to pull up the exact ones yet uh they're not yet in the android beta uh but you know Google has been making some updates to its accessibility features in uh in the last few months. Uh, mm-hmm. not in, instead of just waiting for like an Android 12 release for low vision, I believe you might be relying on something like a screen reader. Um, and I, you know, Android or Google is at least constantly kind of working on updating that. So let me get you the uh ex- exact updates. I know there are some improvements mm-hmm. coming to the Android 12 UI, unless you know offhand V what that might be. I don't. I was actually just thinking, and this is, I swear to God, I'm not like an Apple booster that just like 
happened like they just timed things out very well yeah oh yeah, um, yeah. we we didn't yes, hear we much did. about specific accessibility improvements to android 12 but i should point out apple did ahead of wwdc outline a handful of really interesting accessibility features that will be part of ios 15 and ipad os 15 so i that obviously i think it was or will be global accessibility day fairly soon so that's kind of feels yep. like why they did it but mm -hmm. at the same time it seems pretty clear that Apple is really keen on playing this up and Android is, is working on it. They just sure. maybe weren't as, as sort of making it a point to have that mm -hmm. front and center in the keynote. The, the new design, yeah. by the way, like Material U does look like a design that could easily be more visually accessible because so, it's less cluttered and they can get bigger, right? Yeah. yeah. That's that's part of the thing. If you mm -hmm. have your system font set to bigger because you have low visibility, I have a friend who is legally blind and their screen is always zoomed into like, 200% or something like that. Mm -hmm. That That's part of what Material U is supposed to do, which is to keep the font size the same, whether you open a different app and somehow they've forgotten the built-in mm -hmm. font uh, command or and, and that sort of stuff. So if you're using uh, uh, that sort of system UI change, that's something that Android mentioned. And also, yes, GAAD, aka Global Accessibility Awareness Day, is coming up or actually has <laughs> happened. I was like, we were thinking we should have something tied up to that, but... uh. Yeah, it felt like playing like being we, we shouldn't just kind of like have something up just because, you know, it should be constant reporting on this issue. Anyway, did we hear anything <laughs> about Android on tablets, by the way, because I remember that was a big deal that you were talking about some stuff. So, Lynn. Did they mention that? Yeah. At all? <laughs> so uh, that's part of material. You I don't uh -huh. think uh, Google necessarily called out tablets specifically during I.O. But material U is meant to kind of adapt to different screen sizes, I believe. And also, you know echo your same chosen design preferences mm -hmm. on all your devices tied to your Google account. So your watch, for example, Wear OS is going to be committed to this whole new material you look um, and tablets should also, and foldables should also, you know, <laughs> offer similar, 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 new looks. similar things. Let's talk about Wear OS, by the way, because you brought it mm -hmm. up. Uh, I mm -hmm. like to make fun of uh, how badly <laughs> Google has handled smart watches. <laughs> There's at least some big and interesting news for the next year, right? Yeah, so huge mm -hmm. news, huge news. Samsung and um, Google, actually Google, I, I don't know if they reached out or whatever, but Google and Samsung are teaming up on the next Wear OS. And because of that, Samsung is completely saying goodbye to Tizen more or less. So so not completely, it's the existing devices that run Tizen OS will continue to run it and get support for three years. And then uh, every other new wearable that, Samsung makes from now on will be running on this new Wear OS that the company says it co-engineered with Google. Are you hype? <laughs> you should be. I'm, uh, I'm, hey, there were some things in Tizen that were clearly better than Android Wear, and it never made sense why the best Android, you know, the Galaxy watches were the best Android specific smartphone, smart watches around. So, and they weren't using Google's platform. So having a little more of a unified thing, I think mm. kind of makes sense this is google realizing we we are bad at this thing especially <laughs> yep. when it comes to like consumer electronics and consumer ui so let's talk to samsung which is the biggest consumer electronics or next to apple one of the biggest in the world so mm -hmm. it makes sense it makes a lot of sense for them to partner um because it's good for samsung it's good for google right surely really quick one question that i've sort of been chewing on that i don't think i ever got a great answer to and i'm pretty sure a few other people have this as well mm -hmm. you know with with the sort of confluence now between Tizen and Wear OS are we looking at a completely different sort of software foundation for Wear OS like is it part Wear OS part Tizen or is Samsung really just saying here yeah Tizen didn't work let's just work with you guys on what already exists and what can exist in Wear OS so my understanding is in terms of a software foundation, we're talking about two levels. We're talking about a mm -hmm. like a deeper level below what the user sees, which is overall how processes are handled in the background, mm -hmm. how um, you know you can get things like constant heart rate monitoring in a way that doesn't sap your battery too much. Mm -hmm. um, at that level, there are changes, right? Google did say that it's expecting things like apps to launch 30% faster. You've got more animations. And I mentioned before, I don't know if on this podcast specifically, but having more animations throughout a UI, even if it's something as small as, as a, a, a something flashing, an element flashing when you tap mm -hmm. it, it makes a UI feel more responsive. Just, hmm. just because you're not kind of just waiting for things to not happen or happen, right? So uh, that level, yes. And then on the whole UI that's facing uh, the watch wearer, um, I, my understanding, based on renders I've seen, 
it's very similar to existing Wear OS, except for uh, the Tiles feature, which Google introduced in 2019 and had it limited to just first-party widgets in the past, is going to expand to include third-party widgets uh, way more than before. Hmm. And we haven't heard a lot of other names, but we've got Calm and Spotify that seem like they're on board. And this Tiles feature was always very similar to this Tizen OS, where it's side-swiping mm -hmm. horizontal scrolling to see all your different, like, apps that you want there and you can customize it put your favorite ones near the the center um so that's where it's very similar to tizen and where tizen was limited in that style before was that it was all pretty much all samsung's own widgets right, right. you had a, like a spotify <laughs> widget here and there you had an uber widget maybe if you wanted to maybe a my fitness pal for like calorie tracking or something but it was basically mostly samsung widgets so now you have the option of side swiping through possibly the whole world of Android apps if, if Google and Samsung get their way. So I that's, do. I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question, V? Do you understand better now kind of yeah. what that software Yeah, actually? no, that's Maybe. usually helpful. It also just seems like a really big deal because I, I think mm -hmm. probably all of us at this point have tried some Galaxy wearable running mm -hmm. Tizen. Like, I think I still have a Galaxy watch s3 or like the frontier or whatever from a while ago around here right and i did love it for what it was but yeah like the biggest sticking point to me at least was it'll do it'll do all of the traditional smart watch functions just fine like it'll do yeah. fitness tracking to an extent which was also very helpful but when it came time to try and figure out other things you could do with a watch right Heisen always felt a little too limited right like as you mentioned mm -hmm. there are a couple companies like spotify like uber that were ride or die like from the beginning mm -hmm. they were talking up their partnerships with samsung yep. for yep. Tizen, and now we finally get maybe everybody it sounds like yeah. a huge world that we might now finally be able to access on our wrists well, we're I gonna mean, get we'll a Bitmoji see. watch face. So. <laughs> Great, you they know that was will. that was definitely a Samsung thing, wasn't it? The I, I would say, imagine. <laughs> even with this partnership, I have a hard time getting too excited for where where Wear OS is going because honestly, even even Watch OS, even the Apple Watch, is kind of limited and not going as far as I'd like. Um, yeah, we'll see. I guess it's better than it's ever has been for Android, right? But it's, given, it's yeah, exciting. Yeah. A lot of people are excited about it. Uh, I Finally. forgot I had one thing to say about this, but uh -huh. I anyway, we'll continue. I remember <laughs> like when all this stuff started and people were talking about smartwatches and people were just so hype on the Moto 360 because it was like it was a round based smartwatch. And those were the simple days when like Moto was like actually still doing cool stuff and they haven't just given up. I would like a return to those exciting days, but I think what that was 2012, 2013, it does feel yeah. like Google yeah. consistently, they've had this platform. They feel to like really grow it. The partnership is all splintered and uh, maybe this will help. Maybe this will kind of unify things. Yeah. I, I remember one thing I want to say. So one of the things uh -huh. that people like about Tizen and, and Galaxy watches is the rotating bezel makes it so yes. easy to just side scroll. Mm -hmm. Yes. I could mm -hmm. see how, you know, that feature that Google seemed to abandon on Wear OS where they actually had a rotating knob that let you scroll mm -hmm. through apps on like an apps list or like a notifications list. I could see Google bringing that back with Samsung on this new Wear OS where instead mm -hmm. of a, or in addition maybe to the rolling, this rotating bezel that Samsung watches would have, maybe other OEMs could make this rotating knob to side scroll through widgets too. It, it might make it easier if you have a lot of apps stacked up sideways. Anyway, this is me kind of just guessing <laughs> and maybe trying to give Google some ideas if they want to give me some credit for this. Well, that's some ideas. I'm can. sure they will definitely give you credit. Yeah. <laughs> they Absolutely. will never. Get in for those but, royalties. Uh, really quick on that accessibility question, by the way, Dev, that you pointed out. I just wanted to just quickly answer that. So in the Material U mm -hmm. uh, announcement post, there is a section on accessibility about Material U design. So it's like supposedly a, the section is called accessible for every need. And like I mentioned, like uh, it's not just the size of the font, but also it allows you to have control of contrast and line width with a contextually mm -hmm. aware system that can customize UIs in more ways than previously possible. So there might be other things that you can adjust to to make it easier to read the, the screen or, or, or mm. elements on the screen. Awesome. Material you guys, just material you. <gasps> Which, uh, which is going to be part of the new look on Wear OS too. Just it's to it's tie a new it look. Uh, Materially, I just can't. I can't get over saying <laughs> it. Let's move over to some other bits. There, there were other, there are like other interesting things. I think they mentioned 
Uh, I wrote up a story about Google basically working with a group of diverse experts, uh, black mm -hmm. and brown experts in the tech mm -hmm. field and in cinematography. They're working on building a more racially inclusive Android camera. So they're actually getting a lot of feedback uh, in from these folks about you know how lighting works and how mm. to deal with uh, auto white balance and auto color balance and exposure levels and things like that. So that you know these uh, future Pixel phones are better at interpreting how light bounces off darker skin. And I think that is going to be a big deal for a lot of users. Honestly, like I'll tell you guys, like smartphone cameras don't do well with my skin tone and uh, I'm not, you know, I I'm a little dark too, guys. So <laughs> it is like, this seems like stuff that is a long time coming. I'm glad to see Google is doing it. Um, it also feels like some of this has been happening already. So I don't know, Sherlyn, do you have a sense of like how yeah. different is this from the way Android cameras has been, you know, yeah. have been working so far? So yeah, no. Uh, mm -hmm. Google has been talking up this whole like we're looking into making sure yeah. cameras are are aware or or you know compensating or you know just evaluating for for different skin tones. Uh, yeah. so first, I heard of it uh, that I remember anyway was during a briefing for Google's new Meet hardware. Mm -hmm. um, it was releasing uh, you know video cameras or webcams for conference calls and that sort of thing. And even in, as early as that, they were talking about how they were looking at uh, how a camera interprets or, or their photography algorithms interpret different skin tones. It's mm -hmm. been a while. And I know that uh, I believe around the time when Google was talking about how you can use Android phones, webcams to measure your heart rate, something like that. Uh, Google might also have talked a little bit sort of like tease that they're looking at improving camera software to understand different mm -hmm. skin tones as well. So They've sort of hinted at this, but this is a big commitment. And sure. you know what? Good for you, Google. I think this is so important. It's good. I mean, it's important mm -hmm. for people to realize, too, cameras are more about than just the lenses or the sensors yeah. they're putting into things, especially for smartphones. Cameras these days are also heavily reliant on software. Google, you know, Google's portrait modes, you know, has been an entirely software thing before cameras, multiple cameras are heading into mm -hmm. uh, into smartphones. So yeah, V, mm -hmm. did you want to add anything here? I was just going to, I, mm -hmm. I've been thinking to myself about all of this, you know, this does sound really cool. And, you know, they did go a bit into sort of how they're doing this, right? Like they're making mm -hmm. sure more pictures of black people are winding up in the mm -hmm. data sets that they're using yes. to train the algorithms. They've sort of enlisted the help of these black creators mm -hmm. who can just sort of more ably kind of give Google a sense of how like what conditions black skin looks good in like i got a very sort of like Issa Rae, uh vibe there because oh well, yeah because in of the insecure, insecure yeah. like yeah. lit yeah. black people beautifully and you know that's unfortunately relatively rare I, I i am a little concerned though like we have seen really really cool announcements and just sort of software features announced at google io that just take quite a while to trickle out mm -hmm. the one that immediately mm -hmm. springs to mind is uh, I don't know if you remember a couple years ago, there was this one Google Assistant demo where everything was just moving lightning fast. Everything was happening oh, yeah. on device. Yep. They had shrunk down the machine learning model to function really yep. beautifully on a phone. And and to my knowledge, you correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like that hasn't made it out to Not any yet. Android device yet. So again, I wonder if this is one of those situations where Google clearly is moving in the right direction, but right. doesn't really have anything to show for it for a while. We'll see. I, so they mentioned that we will probably see something on Pixel phones this fall or soon. And I think the other mm -hmm. interesting thing is Google said, whatever they learn, they're going to be sharing with the rest of the Android community. Mm -hmm. So this will probably first appear in like the Pixel camera or the Google camera. What is that? Is it a specific app that's on Pixel phones now? Um, but it will probably be within that and then hopefully on other Android devices eventually. Given given mm -hmm. uh, Google's ability to kind of just push out Night Sight as quickly, like as it did after first announcing Night Sight. And I don't think this is exactly the same technology, but in the same kind of realm, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see this rollout with eh, the next Pixel phone, maybe the Pixel 6, sure. not the 5A, probably not, but maybe the <laughs> Pixel 6. Maybe yeah. something cool. There was also, they showed off something that I think nobody expected, which is called mm. Project Starline. Can you tell me mm -hmm. a bit about that, Sherlyn? <laughs> yeah, Project Starline is this... Oh, uh, well, I believe Sundar Pichai also called it a mm -hmm. moonshot. This is this is mm -hmm. video conferencing at the next level. This is when you make a meet call with your friend in the future with Project Starline technology, which is, by the way, not going to come out anytime soon. <laughs> it uses light yeah. field technology, uh, so specialized cameras to kind of detect you, the caller, and then uh, your, your, your features in 3D, and then mm -hmm. also project that to the person you're calling so that when you see each other and you're talking to each other on this call, 
you both look like you're actually sort of there you're, yeah. you're in 3d your your features your facial features and your the depth of your your person mm -hmm. uh can be viewed of course through a specialized display <laughs> like almost a holographic looking glass yeah, style yeah. display well, let me just but say they're, they're set up for this thing the way they demoed it right is that you step uh, into a booth it looks like it looks like a, a diner booth right where you step in mm -hmm. you're in front of this giant screen this window there's a 3d depth sensing camera that takes your image and you know compresses that shoots it to another one of these booths somewhere else and then on the other side is a giant display it's not just like mm -hmm. a small screen it is yeah. like you know life it size. is like life size it looks like a mm -hmm. uh, bathroom vanity mirror basically <laughs> where you see a lifelike 3D version of the person you're talking to. I'm sure they couldn't convey it super well. There, there is a video out there that Google mm. is showing off. You could still see some compression. You could see some like yes. you know issues around the edges. But I'm sure in person, seeing the actual 3D depth would make it seem even more exciting or interesting, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I. Now that you've kind of broken it down, I'm also concerned about like how you know what sort of internet speeds and bandwidth yep. are we talking because this is <laughs> like 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 i said that pitai said mm -hmm. probably a moonshot because it it's going to rely heavily on our favorite topic 5g it's sure. going to rely very heavily on you know very good data, <laughs> data, speed, data speed. I, I will say there were google people um i think some of the folks working on this were geeking around on twitter and john carmack the co-founder of id software you know the formal cto of uh, oculus uh, mm. was was also geeking about out about this and google people confirmed to him that it does not take it does not need crazy internet it could probably it, they said like <laughs> 10 10 megabits per second which is you know kind of the no. standard for 4k no video kidding. yeah so yeah they're saying it doesn't take that much but i'm sure the this overall hardware setup you can't just replicate this anywhere but i could see this being the sort of thing that pops up in like uh offices or something down the line where they have phone booths and you actually want to have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody this is a way to do it that's better than a webcam at least yeah given we're all remote working we're <laughs> all kind of i think going back to maybe some sort of hybrid uh, environment for a bit this might this is very interesting v what do you think I would love to put one of these in my basement. God <laughs> darn it. My space is you perfect. Put everything for it. in your basement. This is all this is also true, but that's <laughs> maybe a story for another time. Another day. But yeah, like it really does seem like the limiting factor here is the hardware. Google mentioned that they're using high resolution cameras and yeah. depth sensors to kind of develop the 3D model of you that appears in this volumetric sort of looking glass style display. And you know, as as exciting as it is, uh, the possibility to maybe just like go to work one day and jump in on a meeting with one of these, like mm -hmm. that's that's not really when I want to use this, right? Like if I want to feel like I'm really talking to someone, it's going to be my dad who lives like an hour or two away and like I can't rent a car and visit all of the time. Like that's those are the kinds of people I really want to feel like I'm in front mm -hmm. of and it, it unfortunately does kind of seem like it'll be a while if ever before we get to have that experience in our homes yeah speaking of moonshots by the way Google also showed off something called Lambda AI which is a sort of like I don't know a smarter way of having natural conversations with Google Assistant and AIs uh what can you guys break this down for me like what was going on here because they were talking to Pluto which was confusing. <laughs> v, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, let me take this one. So as I understand it, Lambda is a sort of a machine learning framework that, that goes, to put it sort of pretty simply, very broadly and very deeply with respect to concepts. And Pluto is a really interesting example. Like in order for this machine learning algorithm to sort of act as though it is the planet Pluto and, and sort of engaging with it mm -hmm. from that perspective, it not only has to understand what Pluto is, but it sort of has to understand related concepts. So space exploration, weather, uh, just sort of the mechanics of the solar system, gravity. So it sort of goes out to sort of build a net of things that it should know about as they relate to Pluto. But then it also goes quite deep in those concepts as well. So <laughs> it's it's maybe not the best explanation, but Google is it's, really doing yeah. it's like wild to see. It's like they're trying to give um, an existential justification for why this AI exists. And I do feel like this is this is how you get Skynet, folks. This is how you get <laughs> you know AI that just it loses its sense of persona and doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. It thinks I am Earth, therefore I must protect Earth, therefore I must destroy all of humanity. 
This is I, where we're I remember, <laughs> I remember similar concerns being thrown around the first time we saw Google mm -hmm. unveil Duplex at an I/O in years past, and yeah. Duplex, uh, as a recap, it was, like was basic Google's... back and forth conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's similar <laughs> to this where it's AI technology where um, the assistant was able to like insert pauses that indicated hesitation during mm -hmm. a conversation with a, a restaurant on the phone, and people were like, "Oh my gosh, this is too real. This is what you know." And and Lambda also has similar. Um, you know that sort of similar feeling to it. It feels like it's trying to build up assistant to be almost a uh, very very human uh, bot, <laughs> and understandably people are yeah. concerned. I, it's, I'm like, it's like it's like a kid's game, right? Where you ask a kid to pretend you are this thing, and then it starts to yeah. act as if you are. It is that thing. I don't know, guys. Maybe we should not give our AI this existential awareness just yet. Until we can control that's why, our AI. Oh, man. Yeah. That is why people are looking into AI ethics and law and how to kind of regulate all of that or to make sure, sure. that doesn't go buck that, that wild. hasn't gone so well for Google lately. <laughs> we will discuss in future episodes because yeah. I have a family member who is deeply investigating mm -hmm. some of these things so we could talk AI about ethics is a big episodes. thing. Google, oh, yeah. for the past couple of months, has historically shown that it, it, has a it has done a bad job of managing its AI ethics department. So we've talked a bit about that. Google mm -hmm. that stuff. Oh, yeah. It is, oh, uh, yeah. I cannot trust Google when it comes to AI stuff right now, unfortunately. Uh, one other thing I think is worth calling out is Smart Canvas, which is something, basically the next evolution of Google Workplace or like all the, you know, all the Google online office software. It's basically a way to like unify the way all of its different apps work. So they showed us some examples, like in a, in a Google Doc, you could basically pipe in a uh, one of your meetings. So you can talk with people as you're working with the doc right alongside it. Right now you can start a Google meeting, you know, and manually say, hey, I'm gonna broadcast this document to you, which is kind of clunky. It's not super smooth. Um, they're basically creating different ways to like tag people. So like in a document, if you wanna say, sure, Lynn, you're gonna be dealing with this part of the podcast, I can tag sure Lynn to it and it'll become part of her tasks. Uh, you can link to other Google documents or you could like seamlessly link into Sheets. You can, within Google Chats, which is their workplace chat thing, you can immediately just hop into like a sheet to mm -hmm. edit data. So it is a more seamless unified way of dealing with all of these office documents. Not the sort of thing consumers will probably see soon, but I think for professionals and especially people who live in the Google Docs ecosystem, it seems like a big deal, uh, at least to me. I don't know about you guys. It's very, very similar to what mm -hmm. Microsoft just unveiled last build mm -hmm. with the, I forget what they call their Fluid thing framework. They, they showed off fluid, fluid framework. We're, we're still only seeing little bits of that, but yeah, it is a similar thing of like saying, hey, um, we're, we're kind of going to unify all of our apps. The yeah. idea of a single document may matter less because everything is inter interconnected basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Dev, just for my own clarification, because as I recall, this was like the first major product announcement of the keynote. And I think at that point during the stream, I was still like, uh, okay, yeah. what's going yeah. on here? What is so here? what's what's the best way to think about this thing? Is it is it really just sort of a fabric that unites all of Google's sort of existing productivity mm -hmm. services? Or is it or is it something more than that? I think it's pretty much that. Like it is not mm -hmm. a separate product. It is like Think of it like the next evolution of Google Docs, you know, and Google Google Sheets and Google Slides. Uh, young folks may not remember a world before <laughs> having, you know, decent online web apps to collaborate mm -hmm. on work. But that was certainly the case. And I think Google Docs landed in like, what, 2006, um, you know, shortly after Gmail arrived. And, hey, I was working in IT. I had to help support how people, you know collaborated on files and worked on documents and stuff. And it was like, this was a game changer because all of, all of a sudden you didn't just have to like share, you know, have a Microsoft Word document, share it on your computer, email it to somebody, um, mm -hmm. have them hopefully do the track changes, have them mail it back to you. Like it really streamlined the whole process of working on documents together. And then Google Docs, yeah, allowed for people to work simultaneously on a single document. So on a sheet, you know, on a spreadsheet or on a, you know, on a presentation slide, that was just game changing. And it, it kind of spurred on everybody, including Microsoft to build better web apps. So now you can do Microsoft Word on the web with Office 365. I don't think it's as seamless. It's not as, um, it's not the sort of thing everybody has. And then Office 365 is a subscription tools like you mm -hmm. have to pay to use that stuff whereas google drive all the google stuff is free so i think google has fundamentally reshaped the way a lot of people work especially students um and this is just the next step 
I totally agree. I remember when I was like, I will be dead before I give up my office software. And then here mm -hmm. I am now. I refuse to work on office. Oh, yeah. No. Are you serious? Sherlyn being oh, stubborn yeah. about, no, yeah, useless things. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. What else is new? What else is new? <laughs> yeah, but of all the things to sort of raise a stink yeah. over, really? No. That's. Well, this okay. is before I was a Google girl. This was when I got, I had Gmail and everything. I was like, no. You take my literally. office keys. From my cold word, dead fingers. Word is so much more useful. Sheets are so limited. For office life. so limited. Yeah. yeah. Hot, Hot mail no, for no, no, no. Just, just office for life. Yeah. Then now I'm like, <laughs> Google all the time. Just screw it. Google They're all like, the time. You, you sent me a dot doc? What the hell even is what that? What the hell is this? Um, you know, it, it is it is hard to fathom, I think, for especially younger folks. Like, this stuff really changed the way we worked. I used to have to, we had to deal with, like, email apps to read our email, you know, in the past. Or deal with really really bad web email apps which were built on cgi and like refreshed manually and they were so oh. bad oh, good um Lord. yeah Did that I was what CGI? things were like before gmail and before <laughs> google docs and everything so hey we're talking about the past this seems really interesting i wonder uh if people will actually latch on to it because uh we are a google workplace over in gadget so hopefully more of these uh you know we'll take advantage of some of these features let's move on let's get away from io <laughs> let's talk about some of our apple reviews and the you just uh oh you just reviewed the ipad pro the latest I ipad did. pro with the m1 mm -hmm. chip which seems very exciting clearly hold it's on, the best hold on, thing hold on. yeah Mm -hmm. I think I want to do something like, mm -hmm. can we just like put a button? A cleaner cut? Yeah, a cleaner mm -hmm. cut on sure, sure, sure. Google I.O. and then go to Apple because I mm -hmm. think that would be better. That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Is there anything else you guys want to add about Google I.O.? We will be playing with all of these things they were announced. So stay tuned to Engadget for, for our coverage as, as it rolls out. So. And yes, we are still like IO as we're recording this is still happening. There's still sessions, oh, yeah. there's still news coming out of these things. So stay tuned for a lot more. It'll never end. Let's <laughs> move on to our reviews of the latest Apple products. V, you just saw and reviewed the iPad Pro with the M1 processor. Clearly, this is the best device Apple has ever produced, right? Right? <laughs> That's, that seems that's, like the hype here. That's kind of what I'm feeling. And I feel weird uh -huh. even, even like being this enthusiastic about a thing because like it's uh, on one hand, it is very definitively still just an iPad. Like the mm -hmm. software, which is a whole other story unto itself. Like we're, we're, I have the very strong impression that Apple's going to do some crazy stuff at WWDC that will mm -hmm. allow developers and Apple itself to really kind of take this hardware to the next level but it's not there yet. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it has the best screen I've ever seen basically in a tablet. It has desktop great performance. It has 5G. Like if you had to ask me what was Apple's best personal computer, like their best all-in-one personal computing package, one could make a pretty strong argument that this is it. And that's frankly kind of insane. Well, let me just say, I was being a little facetious because mm, uh, well. I'm not going to say this is Apple's best product because a good product has to have both great hardware and great software. And as you just said, and as is the title of your review, this device makes it really clear that Apple's hardware has kind of outpaced at least where the iPad OS is and where its mobile software is. To me, that feels limiting, right? Because this thing is as expensive as a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro, if you go up to the big price, it oh, is yeah. heavier than a MacBook Pro mm -hmm. when you add on the, the new keyboard, which is wild to me. <laughs> and yet it is, um, it is less capable, right? Because it is, it can only run the iPad OS apps. Uh, it is very limited in terms of how you can multitask and do things. It is a vision into the future, but it also seems like not fully equipped to replace somebody's MacBook Pro. Somebody who needs a MacBook Pro would still, you, you couldn't just move over to the iPad Pro entirely, right? Like maybe. And and here's where, <laughs> here's where like the uh -huh. cognitive dissonance comes into play. Like, I've been reviewing iPad Pros for a long time. And for mm -hmm. basically the entirety of the time that they've existed, they're basically just bigger iPads. They've relied yes. on the software to sort of define what that experience means. And better screens. Like they and, had high refresh rate screens before yes. anything else. Yeah. Very on true. IPad. Yeah. So they they specifically chose areas of focus where they could where they knew they could sort of push the envelope a bit and you know, kind of pick up steam for for future and future endeavors. But I, I have also sort of come to the realization over the last few years I've reviewed these things that like maybe maybe the way that we work on a computer, like at this point in my uh -huh. life, uh -huh. I would strongly prefer to use a laptop more than basically any other kind of computer. But it depends maybe, on the work, but yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah. But like, I don't know about you. My workflow is generally like Photoshop, photo editing, a lot mm -hmm. of web browsing, a lot of writing. I'll maybe record, you know, a podcast or like another thing that I'm working on. Like there's, th that's, that's like 85 to 90% of like my daily use case. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff you can do on an iPad. So I wonder if there's just like a generational shift at play where people like us who have come mm -hmm. up on traditional PCs, on laptops, have turned to laptops as our main mode of portable computing. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we're just in for a shift. Like maybe we are officially last generation and people really can kind of fit their lives into an iPad. I know it's weird to mm -hmm. talk about, but it is weird. I, yeah. I feel like there are quite a few people out there who could probably make this work without too much trouble. I've I've talked to a lot of people about that. And honestly, I'm thinking of like eventually getting an iPad Pro, maybe not this model, but maybe mm. last year's at a discount, which, hey, by the way, folks, that is the best way to get hardware. Get it refurbished, get the last model, get it cheaper. Um, but I want that high refresh rate screen. I want like a nice portable writing machine and something to just write on and it consume a bit of media. Sure. It won't replace my desktop. I have a huge desktop PC here for gaming and for mm -hmm. doing podcast production because I got to sometimes edit things. Um, sometimes I do a little bit of video editing. Like there's stuff I need to do. You can do it on the iPad. It's just not ideal. I do agree there is probably a generational shift here. My main question for you, V, like do you feel a real difference with this iPad Pro compared to last year's, which was also really fast. We said the same exact thing actually <laughs> where <laughs> this is some of the best hardware around but the software just isn't there yet. Uh, that wasn't an M1 chip, but it was still really fast. Can you actually feel the difference this year? Mm, basically, no. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. But again, but again, that, that boils down to like my use cases. Like yep. by far, the one thing I use any computer for more than anything is just like trying to write because I'm not great mm -hmm. at it. And sure. I just have to like bash my head against the keyboard <laughs> until something of value comes out. Um, I will say though, there are... I, I, do, I never got the impression that I was ever using the M1 to its fullest. And again, that's, yep. that's a software mm -hmm. thing. Like mm -hmm. developers simply have not had the time required to, to optimize their apps and sort of build in sort of the forward thinking features to kind of make these experiences distinct. Mm -hmm. um, LumaFusion is a great example. It's probably the premier video editing app on iPad right now. And it does work really well. I was exporting 4K videos, you know, every, like adding transitions and sort of doing the basics of video editing work felt really, really fast. Like I had no mm -hmm. complaints there. But when it comes to export, for example, yeah. any video editor will tell you that like exporting is like the part where you cross your fingers and like pray that everything works out yeah. okay. And you and walk away from your computer because you can't do anything else. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, I've rendered stuff on my like actual personal PC that's taken like 40 minutes. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to make lunch. Bye. Mm -hmm. But compared to last year's iPad Pro, which used the A12Z chipset, mm -hmm. this year's iPad Pro was maybe 30 seconds faster, maybe <laughs> 30 seconds, oh, on the encode, yeah. On the encode, yeah. yeah. And, you know, switching into Premiere Rush, which is, mm -hmm. you know, a very different kind of editing app, but one that's sort of available mm -hmm. cross-platform, so it's nice to try. The difference was a little bit more palpable right. there, but but even then, mm -hmm. not by much. So is the screen any different, by the way? Like, because oh. this has mini LEDs, right? And it's still, so last year's was high refresh rate. Last year's was still really bright, but the bezels and stuff are the same. It's just mini LED this year. So that must be noticeable, right? It, it is some of the time. Again, what? well, hold on, <laughs> hang, hang on, hang on. When you're, when you're doing that stuff that, that we do, which is like writing a lot and recording and like web browsing yep. and like researching, you will not tell the difference. The max brightness uh -huh. in those situations is 600 nits. So exactly like what it was on last year's iPad. The which is really bright. 600 nits is bright surprisingly yeah, bright you're doing fine like yeah. this is totally usable outdoors but mm -hmm. when things really get crazy when you actually start to watch videos or play yeah. games especially with hdr content mm -hmm. at that point the max full screen brightness jumps up to a thousand nits and there are you know if you've got hdr content going like those really bright mm. you know portions those can hit 1600 so mm -hmm. long story short the stuff that's bright gets really bright and the Good. stuff that okay. is supposed to be dark stays dark or you know dark enough because because you know, of mini leds because yeah. of mini led because of all mm -hmm. these localized dimming zones because of like the ten thousand mm -hmm. tiny leds that they had to develop precision machinery to place on the back plane of this display when mm -hmm. you're watching videos it is night and day better than what we had before but for that's interesting anything okay. else mm -hmm. you're not going to see a whole lot <laughs> my uh Sherlyn, do you want to jump in here with any questions 
Because do you I, watch a lot of video on your iPad? Because I watch, I watch video I watch on my TV constantly. Maybe I'm just on like an iPad? on on the yep. couch in my bed. Like I have a TV that's decently nice, and I only use it when I'm like playing PS5 or like having uh -huh. dinner, and I want to mm. watch The West Wing, so I feel less alone. Uh, every other time, I'm on a phone or a tablet or something. So yeah, in those cases, uh -huh. it does kind of feel like the iPad has sort of taken over as the capital uh b capital d best display in my home mm -hmm. how about this though why not just put mac os on it it is running the mac hardware it's literally running the m1 chip now mm -hmm. like it has there there's a keyboard accessory they can optimize it for a touch screen why you know would you do you think that's something apple would ever do would no. that make this a better machine Mm -hmm. It might make it a, it wouldn't necessarily make it a better machine. Right, it right. makes it a different machine. And Devendra, you raised an interesting point earlier where like you, you might buy an iPad Pro someday, and yeah. but you would only ever use it as a supplemental It device, would never right? be my only computer. Yes. Right. And Apple, mm -hmm. I think, I think for a long time, they thought maybe, maybe this is where everything is really at. Sure. And this is what we focus on. Tim Cook has said in his own words, the iPad was Apple's vision for the future of computing. And now, especially with the pandemic sort of driving Mac sales up, like Mac sales have been through the roof, especially mm -hmm. in the last quarter's earnings, it's become pretty clear to Apple that at least for now, there are people who could feasibly move full time into an iPad Pro, but that's not what's happening on a market level. People are buying a lot of iPads, but they're also buying a lot of Macs. So mm -hmm. with that sort of very keen understanding of the situation, I don't think Apple at this point for the next few years at least is going to say, hey, you know what? Let's just put Mac OS on an iPad. Let's yeah, just blur the line entirely. That's never going to happen. That, that was old Apple. That was 2005 Apple when they did the Intel <laughs> transition. They were like, hey, you can put Windows on this sort of. Um, by the way, weird thing, weird thing. I was writing up, uh, what, I'll talk about this later, but I wrote up like, you know, a story about how Sony is kind of faltering where it is now. I didn't realize, I forgot the news that, uh, Steve Jobs initially pitched Sony to run Mac OS in like 2000. Who would so like Sony? Yeah, I, on I Sony like Bio at the computers. time, Vios yeah. were like the, Bios were the hotness. Oh, it's yeah. so beautiful. Man, so RIP. Beautiful. R.I.P. By hey, they're still also the we're still getting like news from, from a company called Bio. It's just not yeah. Sony. <laughs> it's just not Sony. Anyway, so the iPad Pro sounds exciting. B. I still that is the sort of thing where I'm like, hmm. If I'm not paying for like baby stuff and saving money and you know dealing with house repairs and whatnot, that would be like a nice little light writing machine I'd like to invest in. But it does not make sense for me to go for this new one when the last year, last year's iPad Pro will probably get cheaper and will be a really good deal. Um, so there's that. But what if, mm -hmm. what if you could get a Mac that doesn't, you know, that stays in one place that lets uh -huh. you do a lot of work hmm. all at once? It comes in cool colors. Yeah. How about a uh, Mac U or iMac? Okay. Um, no, no. no. <laughs> Mac U. Put that one Mac back U. in the drawer. iMac. Devendra, uh, I review <laughs> the iMac. M1, uh, which was a lot of fun because I've I've tested out iMacs before. I've played with them. This thing just feels so different than any other iMacs, right? It has the same basic design. It is a giant display on a small little pedestal foot, uh, but it is so thin. It's like 11 to 12 millimeters thin throughout the entire device. So it is, it is just like a flat, super flat object. Um, there is no hump like the older IMAX, it's really light too. It's under 10 pounds. So it's like 9.8 pounds, Jeez. which sounds heavy compared to laptops and stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of people who have IMAX who always move them around their house, like especially during pandemic times, right? Like you're moving around to do video chats in different places. Sometimes uh, I see people doing it if they're on broadcast or something or on a podcast, they'll move their computer to a different room. This computer is basically the first portable desktop. I've ever seen because I was just so tempted to like put it in my kitchen. You know, I brought it upstairs, put it in my kitchen, and I talked to some folks at Apple. They're like, Yeah, but I have it there for cooking videos and to pull up recipes because it's easier than having just an iPad propped up. Uh, it is a bigger screen, it's a 24 inch screen. The screen looks amazing. It's the M1 chip, so it's super fast. I brought it up to my wife's office um, to do some writing upstairs just because I like the natural light there better. It is really cool. Are you guys excited by this? It's colorful, which is nice too. Uh, yeah. I, I think we've seen 
all in ones with handles in the past, by the way. Like, oh, way sure. back in the day, with when handles are lit because they're heavy. Um, <laughs> because they're heavy, yes. There was also, and I don't know the weights of all the all in ones in the world. You obviously yeah. have like the more old, experience so the there. Old iMac 21 and a half inch was closer to 20 pounds. That thing was like That's 19 crazy. pounds. Yeah. So, yeah. That's insane. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some all-in-ones designed for use in places like kitchens and living rooms, too. Sure. Just, just FYI. But, but I mean, not yeah. to say that, like, you're wrong in calling this, like, a very lightweight iMac or, or, or mm -hmm. all-in-one. But I'm, I'm more curious, Dev. When we first saw the announcement for these iMacs, one of the big, well, like one of people's biggest issues was that chin. Did that bother you at all during your testing? So, I don't, I don't like the chin. I don't, I yeah. don't. Yeah, you know, it's not the best thing in the world. Uh, I'm all about super thin bezels. This is why we love Dell's XPS lineup so much. They did slim down the bezels around the top, the sides and the top. Mm. Um, the chin is actually there. Now that I've tested it, this thing has six speakers and like mm. uh, force canceling woofers and things mm. like that. Like there's a huge speaker array. So it actually sounds really good. So it makes music sound really good. It makes movies sound really good. It's at most capable so you can watch like get some simulated 3d sound and stuff it is um it is like a capable little sound machine so that is why that space is there you cannot have good sound without dedicating some space to it um unfortunately that's just physics so i'm once we see the teardowns i'm pretty sure we'll see like a lot of that space is just taken up with speakers so i would like to see less chin but until they like come up with other ways to bring in good sound and for a machine like this you probably don't want to have external speakers you know you you want like a nice clean setup I would rather have this. So it didn't really bother me after mm -hmm. seeing it for a while. Hmm. Yeah. Dev, are you concerned at all? Sorry. Just wanted mm -hmm. to ask, is, are you concerned at all that, you know, you, you spec this thing out when you buy it, you get it, you use it for however long you use it. But yeah. as far as rather where there's no upgradability here at all. Right. That's just, I mean, the old, old IMAX, like back in the 20 pre 2010 era, sure. You, you could upgrade, you could add a little more Ram, you could do some stuff. Uh, that was always fun. Uh, but no, there, there's no upgrading here. I mean, these things are all, you know, it, it is what it is right now. We are buying self-contained devices that cannot be upgraded. If you care about upgradability, don't buy an all in one, you know, at that point, mm -hmm. uh, even consider a Mac mini because I, can you open up a Mac mini? I, I haven't actually can. tested that. Yeah. So Mac minis are great options, you know, especially if you want the M1 chip and you want to pay a little less and then you can have your choice of monitor. Um, this is just a good, like, Hey, uh, I, we're a family. We want to buy a computer that sits in a central spot that everybody can use. Kids can use it for homework. You know, different parents can log onto it with a new touch ID sensor on the keyboard really easily. It is like the ideal family computer. And it's also like if you have young kids and they don't have their own laptops because kids shouldn't have laptops until, you know, they're a little older. Uh, this is like a good machine to have to like set up in the living room to let them do their work or the kitchen table or something. Like I think for a lot of people, this is kind of like a good family work machine and also mm -hmm. directly opposed to whatever the iPad Pro is doing, right? In terms of the future of work, sometimes the old ways are better, I think. Like this is kind <laughs> of showing that, yeah. I mean, okay, uh, speaking, yeah. Of, mm -hmm. speaking of old ways, pre-2010 era and what you said about speakers, I just want to say that I remember a little nostalgically Back uh -huh. in the day when I was using computers where they came with like a pair of speakers you plug yep. in and then a you pair can of, like, control the volume dial. Garbage speakers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really like a, a echo looking <laughs> thing. Were those but the days for them. you? Those beige those, beans. Yeah, those beige or black sometimes. Beige. So it's all my, oh, like, man. Yeah. And then <laughs> yep. like computer screen was freaking thick as F. But yep. Yes. Let, let me just say a few other things here. I like the idea that they brought back color because I also think the iMac kind of strayed away from what it was trying to do originally with the original like big big old CRT iMacs, right? Those things were colorful and cute and they made computers friendly for people because back then uh, PCs were these ugly gray boxes, you know? Gateway was kind of different for putting them in <laughs> white boxes. And then there was Sony that was doing dark boxes and that was like the extent of PC design. Apple introduced color into the fray and they went away with that, I think, maybe because they started going down the Johnny Ive, like, got to get your, your brushed aluminum, got to get your, you know, your your cool colors. What, <laughs> what is this thing? His chamfered edges. Um, <laughs> it really, everything started to look really monotone and gray. And this color is just like a pop of life. I got the orange one, which just, it looks kind of creamsicle from the front. It's just really cute and approachable. I really like it. I do not like Apple's uh, keyboards and mice. Um, this is just a reminder. The mm. Magic Keyboard sucks. Uh, and the Magic Mouse is awful, but the trackpad is actually really good. So I would actually recommend a lot of people 
if you don't like the feeling of the Magic Mouse, put on another mouse or get the, the Magic Trackpad, which is a nice big touchpad. Uh, it just feels really good. Yeah. Any any other questions, guys? Like, I, there, there are some downsides I'll get to soon. Wait, Dev, what's your beef with the Magic Keyboard? It's, uh, I don't like the way it feels. I just don't like the way, it, it, there's not enough key depth. You know, it is a little small and cramped. So I noticed like, I had to like hold my hands together like a little, like an ant to type. And I'm like, this is mm -hmm. no way to live. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to live like this. Uh, but I'm also spoiled because normally I use like nice yeah. spread out ergonomic keyboards on my PC. So that feels good. But even compared to like the laptop keyboards, I feel like for a laptop, I center myself a little more. Whereas on a big screen, I kind of want more space for my hands to like stick, mm -hmm. you know, spread out. So it's a weird balance for me, but hey, you could plug in any other devices you want to these things. Uh, a couple of downsides, uh, we have fewer ports than before. So it's only at most four USB-C ports, two of them are Thunderbolt 2. If you buy the entry level model, it's only two USB-C ports, which kind of sucks. Um, there's ethernet on the power brick of the more expensive model, but not on the cheaper one. You could buy that separately. And these things are expensive. You know, like it starts at what? I gotta look it up, like 12 or 13.99. But once you start adding more RAM, like going from eight gigabytes of RAM to 16 gigabytes is another 200 bucks. If you wanna add even more storage, that is like that creeps up really quickly. So this is not an inexpensive computer, hmm. but I do think for families that want like a thing for everybody to work around, especially if, uh, if you want to start trying to move to the iPad Pro life or something on your own, and you still want to have a nice big machine around to do some like serious PC productivity work, something like this makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Let me just, okay. <clears throat> do, you guys have, do you guys have any other questions about the iMac? Should I buy one? Should I just I go for it? <laughs> do you buy one? I, you will Stop probably it. buy one because you make terrible yeah, purchases. You buy decisions. everything, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm about to move. Yes. What I don't you box. buy? I need another big box. <laughs> well, well, yeah. well, it's very yeah. portable, though. And I was thinking of maybe getting a Surface laptop because of that screen. But maybe having a bigger screen that doesn't move anywhere mm -hmm. or doesn't have to move anywhere could be good. Anyway, could I, be good. this is anyway. all for me. This is extremely so. Why don't for you, me. hey, V, Check maybe out I have a suggestion. Yeah. Yes. Anytime Charlotte. you want to buy something, you just send that money to me. No. And but I, I will <laughs> uh, put it in an investment account for you. No, thanks. But I do owe you a cake. Oh. Oh, yes, you do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me let me wrap this bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Be sure to check out our reviews of the iPad Pro and the iMac. And check out our video reviews, too, because you get to see these things in action. And this was the first review I got to shoot uh, in my house, which was kind of nice. And, you know, it, it was fun. It was good to put the iMac in different places. Let's go on to the audience q &A. Okay, yeah. So, uh, chat, we are taking your questions now, and we can talk about anything from Google I.O. and the Android ecosystem to um, Apple stuff. Uh, let me just take a note of where this segment ended. Let's mm -hmm. say that it was 02 on the dot. Okay, so I have a lot of c questions and comments banked. So I think we're just going to try to get through them as quickly as possible and then maybe go directly to live chat. So uh, first one that I have banked is Jonathan Anderson says, um, in terms of Apple TV, why would you get an Apple TV when you can get a smart TV or Roku and save the HDMI space? Uh, I mean, that involves buying a whole new TV. So, well, they, yeah. But or Roku. if you're, yeah, yeah, if you're putting in money uh, on like TV watching experience, why not go for the whole TV? It's a little different than spending. It depends on how much you're spending. I think a good TV, you could get some TCLs for like five to 600 bucks. But no, if I think most people don't upgrade their TVs that often. So that's the main thing. If you are buying a new TV, there's a good chance you're going to have all the apps you need. You know, it is really hard. You cannot buy a dumb TV anymore. Um, so there is that. But I will say, and especially now that the I, the Apple TV, kind of the quote Apple TV app is on other platforms, there's less of a reason to get this thing. I agree. Uh, that could be why. I am why. not sure yeah. that... I have a Samsung TV. I am not yep. sure that Apple TV Plus is on Samsung How old TV. is your Samsung TV? It's like a couple years old. That's, that's the difference. Like I think 2018 plus or 2019 plus is when they started getting it. So anyway, hmm. a lot of TVs got that app, uh, but not 
everything will. So I personally just really like the Apple TV interface compared to like my TV apps or something. I have a Roku TV upstairs. It is nice, but I still hop over to the Apple TV because I'd rather have everything in a self-contained interface. And I just like the flexibility of it. It can run Plex. It could do different things. Um, and the so new this Apple was... TV has a better remote too, which is the big thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this was like, even before we started talking about Apple stuff. So yeah. uh, th the rest of these questions, I think are kind of going through you know our segments so mm -hmm. while we were talking about um google io uh love gupta um said gaming on wear os and then just three fire emojis <laughs> sure Do with that what you will sure um, yeah i have played 2046 on the uh, watch in the past <laughs> i forget which one i'm sure you have yeah but i have uh then gonzalo costa um says uh, what about the absence of cheaper Pixel Buds from the event, from Google I.O.? Mm. <clears throat> we mm -hmm. sort of talked about this at uh, on our post show. We were yep. expecting hard... Uh, we were thinking if there was any hardware at all, it might be the Pixel Buds A, because Google mm -hmm. did sort of break its own embargo there, I guess, by leaking it itself. Uh, but no, it was not there. The absence is not surprising, because Google I.O. is typically a very software-heavy show. They have had like little phones or, or Nest devices show up there in the past. But I just say those are probably coming soon, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. They don't need a whole event for those either. They could just be like, hey, yeah, they're that, here. Go buy them. That's a press release and a new link on the on the <laughs> Google store. Which, by the way, if anyone's interested, Google did just open up its first physical store in New York City. So if yeah. you're near Chelsea, maybe go find that's some fun. there. Near near Chelsea Market, which Google owns the entire building now, I assume, or on Chelsea Market. They've also had a, like an experience space in that area yeah. near our office in the past. I, I remember visiting. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think there have been like physical stores with a lot of Google branded products, but maybe mm -hmm. not a like specific Google store. Yeah. yeah. And they've done a lot of pop ups, but uh, I think so this then, is like permanent. Then we've got Pat Kilo that says that they are excited by the new iMac design. Uh, I love that there is an option for a vase mount. There so is, yeah. You oh. can mount it on a monitor arm for more huh. flexibility. Ooh. That would be so thin too. I like, I like really want to see that in action because this machine is so thin. So even having it without the foot, must look incredible. Yeah. I, but you, you have to buy it separately. You have yeah, to buy but, the Vesa version separately. Oh, really? You can't just remove the stand. So that's okay. Nice. Oh. Yeah. Oh well, never mind then. I guess I'm yeah, right. that one. Well, <laughs> man, that's that. You're is like, I was. I'm ready to drop two thousand dollars. That's <laughs> for no reason. Story of my life. <sighs> Uh, yep. That is such an Apple thing to do. It's like, oh yeah, like the the more accessible, like better, better, like more mm -hmm. flexible version of things. You have to want it specifically. We do not yeah. just make the more flexible thing the default. They will always lean towards more general design rather than more flexible design. But I also, I'm sure they have the stats on that. Like the amount of people are minuscule compared to the amount of people that are going to be buying an iMac, the amount of people that want a base mounted. And they're going to be the ones that are most vocal online. So you will hear them, but <laughs> there aren't going to be enough of them buying these things for them to justify putting a flexible base amount on it. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, Sandeep McCall says, uh, I heard the news that Apple Music will su support hi-fi audio. Yes, we're mm -hmm. going to be talking about we'll that talk a about little that. later yeah. in the episode. Uh, but my question is, how do you listen to hi-fi audio in on an iPhone which doesn't have a headphone jack. You don't. There's a reason that I that I uh, banked this comment because yep. oh boy, isn't it? Is it like directly in my wheelhouse of? <laughs> Please have a headphone jack. Please have a headphone. Um, no, no, or or you can. They apparently are prepared for people who have um. What do you call it? Headphone amps. So like, if you have a headphone amp that plugs into one of your devices, that can process the high resolution signal. But yeah. Uh, we will talk I, about, I, I think, the funniest bit of this, which is about the, the AirPods Max, a $550 pair of headphones <laughs> that does not support high-resolution audio. We will talk about that in a bit in the news section. Yeah. Uh, so then we have a question from Mark Dell that says, is there any good way to use the M1 Mac with a game console? I use yeah. it instead of my monitor as my uh, at my desk and plug a uh -huh. console into it as well as having a computer. No. Because Mac stuff you can't wants use it, to only um, be Mac You can't stuff. plug a console into it, unfortunately. Like, it's not just, you can't just have another display. You can spit another display out from it, from the USB-C ports, but the screen can't be a display, unfortunately, which is another flexible thing you could get with a PC all-in-one or just, you know, 
just, just get a desktop, get a desktop and a real monitor and a separate <laughs> monitor. And then you can juggle things however you want. If you want flexibility, do not buy the all in one Mac. Like that. Yeah. It's like a big warning sign. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I recently got a, um, a, uh, 4k UHD monitor from, um, our friends at lucky gold star. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> and, uh, LG, that's the mm -hmm. old name for LG. Um, yep. and, uh, so like I'm looking forward to the possibility of like plugging a PS5 or something into this. On the other hand, then there's the psychological issue of do I want to be playing video games in the same spot where I do work? Like if you have no I, choice, I do have <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. yeah, that's true. But like I do very much have kind of like a latrine behavior where it comes to like, mm -hmm. okay, this is where I do work, this is where I do other stuff. <laughs> latrine <laughs> behavior, yes. The, the, um uh, Chris is looking at me funny. This, that's where animals <laughs> do a certain thing in a certain place, specifically their their bathroom business. Yeah. yeah. But um, you live uh, in New York. You can, you do have that flexibility, unfortunately, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. If you want to have two separate gaming spaces, well, but, yeah. But the thing is that, like, even if you're living in a small New York apartment, like the difference of three steps could be a lot. So, Good. like, if you have mm -hmm. a TV not that far away, then, yeah, you might want to keep your monitor as a workspace. For sure. And yeah. the three steps away mm -hmm. on the couch is where you do your gaming. I always prefer gaming away from the PC, honestly, unless it's, like, a big PC game. Um, but then you can also pipe your video over to TV, too. So I often end up doing that. Uh, do we have any more questions? Other we yeah, we have. Yeah. We're, yeah, I'm looking at some other questions. Let's uh, pick one more because we it is. Yeah. We'll yeah. Cause we, yeah, some, we've got we've got a lot yep. a lot of other things to get to. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, Jason, Jacob uh Strakusma, i think that's how it's pronounced mm -hmm. uh says any talk about accessibility for blind people at google io yes actually if you want to uh, go back um in the youtube live stream we talked specifically about google io mm -hmm. and new android stuff um, the material you design is uh, puts a lot of thinking into um low visibility and um vision impaired design um is there anything else? I try to go for new people mm -hmm. because we've got some frequent flyers in the chat and I want to make mm -hmm. sure that it, it isn't just like the three people show. Yes. Although um, we appreciate everybody who returns. Yeah. Okay. Here's one from Jonathan Anderson. Although, okay, yes, this is a returning question. Does the 3.5 millimeter to lightning have, um, is it DAC or DAC support to support the hi-fi? I don't believe so. I do not believe so. Yeah, I, I don't believe. I, I think like the Hi-Fi requires a separate DAC, because Apple does not put higher resolution hardware in it than than they actually need. You know. But again, yeah, if you if you were using a normal phone with a, maybe a three and a half millimeter DAC, um, sometimes they have better built-in amps than uh, you know than their USB stuff. Okay. okay, so other than that, we've got a whole lot of other stuff yep. to get to. So um, I'm going to clear out my uh, bank of chat questions. If you have any questions that come up during the rest of the recording, I'm going to be looking at them. We can do another little Q&A afterward. But we've got to get to our other news, our mm -hmm. working on our picks and everything. So take it away. I'll try to hustle through these, just FYI. Shirley, I think we could just kill the Qualcomm stuff, just given... Yeah. Unless you think That's it's fine. super important. Okay. We'll just say that go read our article. You could say that. Yeah. Whatever you want. <clears throat> Let's move on to some other news. And boy, yeah, again, this has been a super busy week. Ford finally announced and showed off their electric F-150 Lightning pickup truck. And uh, just have to say, this, this thing looks beautiful. It looks like an F-150 but it has 563 horsepower. It has a pretty, I believe, over 300 uh, mile range on the extended mm -hmm. battery, 775 pounds of torque, um, the most of any F-150 ever. But be best of all, this thing costs under $40,000, and that is even before the tax credits, uh, which could bring the price down to like around $33,000 for many people. This is a big freaking deal. Even if you don't care about uh, pickup trucks and big trucks like this, the F-150 is the most popular car in America. I believe Ford ships uh, around like a million new ones every year. So this is a big deal for people who aren't into Teslas, but for people who demand 
the kind of the power side of electric cars because electric cars can be so fast and offer so much torque. This thing is super powerful since it has no engine because it's just a computer on wheels. Uh, the front where <laughs> there is normally a giant engine is just a giant trunk. So the front is huge. Apparently, uh, can hold like uh -huh. two uh, two uh, mid sized uh, what do you call it Bodies? suitcases suitcases okay. plus other stuff. So it's like. The thing about pickup trucks is that they're not really convenient for like getting the groceries because if you stick them in the back, they're going around everywhere. It's hard to like keep things in place. The frunk is good for like ease of reach and manageability and stuff, but you still have the power of the pickup truck. You still have a huge bed in the back for like carrying stuff back from Home Depot or for your job or something. This thing's only going to be available in the like four door version too. So that's the one that families can actually use. I'm just really excited by this. Uh, it is so much better looking than the <laughs> ugly Cybertruck. So <laughs> I think this is really interesting. This is a really good year for Ford and electric cars, every, right? Every mm -hmm. time you say frunk, Dev, I, frunk. I don't know if you're saying a different F word. Um, <laughs> but my... <laughs> what what you, could you be talking about? I don't know. My question Funk? for you. My question <laughs> for you is, is this a, um, the Ford vehicle that, that Biden somehow accidentally announced during Google Live? Accidentally. It's all purposeful. Come Straight on. Up. Like it was, okay. it was yeah. right behind him during his, uh, the day before they officially announced it, it was right behind him. Uh, uh, and he mentioned Ford has an electric, you know, it's fine. They don't need to be secretive about it. Biden yeah. took off in this car and like there's footage of him <laughs> just like speeding down a jetway uh, with the secret, <laughs> secret service kind of running after him. So this is, cool. this is cool. Between this and the Mustang EV, yeah. uh, it does seem like Ford is onto some really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I think this is exciting. I am paying more attention to electric cars and hybrid cars and things like that. I'm not a mm -hmm. normal car person, but I do like the idea of computers on wheels. So we'll be keeping a close eye on this for sure. Sherlyn, you also want to talk about some new display yeah. types from Samsung? I love how in the week mm -hmm. with Google I.O. companies are like, no, we're still going to shoot you with all kinds of news anyway. <laughs> Google, Other I mean, stuff. Samsung. Yeah, it, right. In addition to Apple reviews and Google I.O. So Samsung um, over at its little, uh, it had an event sort of mm -hmm. under the Samsung display umbrella uh, this week. And I believe it was on May 17th. So maybe Monday. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. um, it had a Display Week 2021 event uh, showing off some concept devices like a double folding OLED panel on a sort of smartphone. Okay. Um, when it's unfolded, which you remember twice, uh, the screen has sort of a, a width or size of 7.2 inches. Uh, you know, so when it's obviously when it's folded, it's like a lot tinier than that. And then it also showed off a slidable OLED display. It extends horizontally, kind of like some of the TCL prototypes we've seen and talked about, and LG as well. Um, and then we also saw at this event, a 17 inch foldable panel. So this would be more for a tablet or like a PC style device, maybe running mm -hmm. Windows, similar to a Lenovo's uh, ThinkPad X1 Fold. So Samsung is like, you know, has sort of been leading, I think the race in terms of getting consumer ready foldable devices out there, but not really showing off much more by way of like interesting prototypes like that, mm -hmm. the, the way that TCL has actually been more active in doing. But it's really cool to see that Samsung's like, we know you, we hear you like trifolds. We hear you like rolling OLEDs. Here hmm. you go. And uh, the idea that we might get these different devices or device types from Samsung soon, while well, soon being a relative word here, mm -hmm. It's also very intriguing. V, you, you're big on foldables. What do you think about these prototypes? Does anyone want a trifold device? Like we've You're saying played. this? You? Yeah. <laughs> it's me, the dummy, who went out and bought my own Galaxy Z Fold 2. Like that's <laughs> that's enough. Um, but no, it's it's really interesting to see Samsung kind of experimenting with this stuff out loud. As you pointed out, TCL has been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, it's helpful for them to just like be able to gauge what people think they might want to do with these things. Because we're still in like smartphones have looked like slabs of glass and metal for God, like a decade now. We're now on the precipice of like really wild new form factors, but no one knows what people want because no one's used one yet. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to see Samsung continue to try this out. We, they have said that they will be doing a sort of more accessible push into foldables this year. So mm -hmm. we're all sort of taking that to mean they're going to be cheaper. So maybe, yeah. maybe mm -hmm. we'll see something like this actually go on sale, but 
Yeah, and just, and not yeah. prohibitively priced. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I do agree that that might be the meaning of the word accessible in that sort of uh, context there, not yeah. not like for people with for sure, needs for sure. or assistive do, needs yet. I almost feel like we're reaching like an innovation precipice here too, where it's like, I don't think foldables are ever going to be as big as smartphones were, like as an overall consumer mm -hmm. shift and a, you know the way we use our tech and stuff. It is a nice thing to have. It's a nice to have. Mm -hmm. It's not a must have. Whereas the yeah. iPhone compared to, you know, every, literally everything that came before it was, oh my God, this is a must have. We yeah. all need a phone mm -hmm. like Change this. the way uh, we live. It changes our lives. So, you know, yeah. hey, I, I think foldables are probably going to have a much smaller market, but it's cool. It's cool to play with. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like it'll ever be essential to a lot of folks. Well, we'll see. <laughs> We well, shall maybe. see. And maybe uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to like more, I think as we move forward, more people are going to do the sort of like, let's separate ourselves more from our tech rather than mm -hmm. let's integrate more of it. Like I think the tech asceticism, like the idea of being mindful and being careful about how you uh, embed yourself in tech and how you live with it is going to be a big deal moving forward too. So foldables, I think will will kind of suffer because of that. But maybe. anyway, let's talk about <laughs> more tech that we're going to be diving into. Let's something big that happened this week yeah. is um, yep. Amazon announced that they're going to be offering lossless audio on Amazon Music at no extra charge. That used to be, you actually used to be able to get hi-fi tracks by paying a little more. Um, no extra charge. They did that because a couple hours later, Apple also announced that Apple <laughs> Music will be offering lossless edit audio at no extra charge, along with Dolby Atmos 3D audio, which I think mm. for a lot of people will probably be the cooler thing because that gives you like simulated surround sound basically with music um this is a big change we're seeing this year we also know uh spotify said that it is going to be doing its own lossless like cd quality service uh spotify hi-fi later this year we don't quite know we don't even know what that's going to be or what it's going to cost but given the fact that apple and amazon are doing it for free now i feel like that puts spotify in a bit of a bind do you guys care at all about lossless audio like about this higher quality stuff no not moi, okay. because I, I, I'm a You, me, girl. you don't care. Look, <laughs> I will say, if I'm a Spotify person, like that's where I've chosen yeah. to invest my time. You better believe I have my like download settings set to maximum quality. Yeah, maximum download, yeah. But at the same time, I'm listening to them over like AirPods or or like the Bose noise canceling 700s, which sound really fine, but are not, really but are not like yeah. odd. Like no yeah. one's going to say those are like premium audio file and they're also headphones. limited uh so they are limited those any wireless headphones they are limited by the bluetooth codex and kind mm -hmm. of like the maximum quality those can spit out uh let me just say i think for uh, the 98 99 percent of users out there they will probably never take full advantage of lossless audio tech because you need to have a dedicated headphone amp uh you know you need to have a good pair of wired headphones that could really capture the nuances of all that extra stuff if you're in a noisy environment, if you're traveling, if you're in your car, if you're on the subway, you having those giant files will not make a difference at all. You will literally not hear it because there's too much other noise to, to even really take advantage of that. So that's one thing. I think like there's there's like you can only go so far with losses audio. The funny thing is that none of the AirPods so far, not even the $549. <laughs> AirPods Max supports <laughs> lossless audio. Now, here's why oh, it's interesting. Boy. It's because, uh, yeah, sure, in wireless mode, I wouldn't expect the AirPods Max to, to support it. You would think in wired mode, right, like just plugging it into uh, your phone or device or something, that it could get higher quality. No, no, <laughs> not at all, because actually this uh, the DAC on that thing is limited to the best wireless quality, you know, because it is meant to be wireless first. So unlike, you know, a normal pair of headphones that you plug in with a three and a half millimeter jack, uh, you, you're paying a lot of money for quality that you can't actually hear on, on the AirPods Max. So I find that hilarious. Nobody's <laughs> talked about those things anymore, right? Do you have those, V? Which ones? The AirPods Max? The no. Max. No, <laughs> no. They were like- I know you were tempted. You were like, hmm. Look, everything, burn every, some money. everything tempts me. I have the <laughs> lowest threshold for buying anything of any human imaginable. Uh -huh. And it's bitten me in the ass several hundreds <laughs> of times. And with the AirPods Max, I say, no, sir. This is this is where I put my foot down. This is where you drew the line. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Thing. We'll thing see because one oh, day we'll God. see V rolling up with the you AirPods will Pro never. Max. Yeah. No, you will. 
We will. We, we sure will totally will. see that. But anyway, I, I uh, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you want to take advantage of Apple lossless music or any of this stuff, buy a good pair of headphones or be prepared to like build out a good pair of hi-fi speakers or something or a good hi-fi speaker setup uh, and get yourself an amp. Like you, you won't just be able to do it with a simple pair of wireless headphones or AirPods or something. Dolby Atmos sound for a lot of people may be a cool little thing. We've seen demos of spatial audio on AirPods, basically simulated surround sound. So... I've tried out some demos of this. I don't. I don't think it's a game changer either. It is a cool feature to have on headphones. Uh, just the idea of like you're standing in front of a live band rather than hearing two channels of audio at you. But I, I, yeah, that's not. It's not earth shattering to me. It's just. It's a cool thing to have. Again, <laughs> let's move on to some other stuff. Sherlyn, IFA, Ifa, is Woohoo! Canceled. So Ifa, the was uh for some reason uh ifa which is by the way uh europe's version of ces except for to me it happens on a sure. smaller scale uh as an electronic show in europe um and it happens in berlin now last month uh the organizers of ifa i'm not gonna attempt to say the name because i'm definitely gonna butcher it uh <laughs> we're like yo we're definitely doing a full-scale return uh, to this show and then it's now been canceled because since it announced that i think a lot of companies just were like we're not we're not going to ifa i don't know what mm -hmm. you're thinking about this full-scale return plus there are like we said many times on the show already it's still a lot of places in the world still plagued by COVID 19 and mm -hmm. its variants mm -hmm. so that always seemed like a dumb idea so now ifa has uh this weekend the, at least uh the organizers were like oh yeah we well, no, we're we're canceling it <laughs> because coronavirus infection numbers in Germany are actually higher now than they were at this time last year. This is awful. Oh, yeah. God. Yep. Imagine that because the, the UK variant mm -hmm. is one that we've been keeping an eye on. And then more recently, yep. the India variant. And then there's variants mm -hmm. in Indonesia and other parts of the world mm -hmm. that just didn't feel like they had enough foresight when they said they were going to go ahead with it this year. They're they're finally like the doing the right 2020 thing. 2020 and 2021. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope more countries get more access to vaccines. I hope more Americans start taking the vaccines. Um, because mm. yeah, we are not we are not as it, a in the clear yet. Yeah, we're not. And I, I one thing that America I feel like has done faster than a lot of countries in the world uh, is is mm -hmm. get its people vaccinated. Uh, in mm -hmm. Singapore, I know my parents both are you know, uh, fully vaxxed up. My brother only just got his first dose and he's like <laughs> very close to my age. Um, but that was because people... they were restricting who was getting it too, right? Like it wasn't true. Open to him yeah. For a while. There was yeah. like classes of people so, like my, my yeah. parents are older and then there's people mm -hmm. in different like lines of work that were allowed to get it sooner. Um, I heard uh, that Taiwan also recently had like 200 cases out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Well, not really nowhere, a pilot, yeah. but yeah stuff is still happening it stuff feels like we're really fast yeah really quickly we're excited for a return to normalcy i understand that but we mm -hmm. really need to be this is just my weekly soapbox of like how we need to be careful wash our hands and you know soap in a box um but anyway <laughs> this news was also announced this week just as a recap though at ifa we usually see a lot of uh news about audio devices sure. wearables TVs. a lot of tvs yeah lots of tvs tablets and laptops and eat a lot of good food in Germany, a lot of Wiener Schnitzel in Berlin. <laughs> Davindra, I feel like you went to one yeah. EFO. I went, yeah, to one we went to one with you guys. Yeah. Yes, that was pretty cool. Um, it was fun. Eva's we... good. Yeah, good food. Eva's a good show. Eva, Eva. I cannot nice wait show. till we can all travel again safely and eat good food mm -hmm. while working too much. That's the that's the oh, story yeah. of our lives. Let's move on. One one other <laughs> little bit of news, Microsoft killed windows 10x officially we have talked about this a bit this was supposed to be the mm -hmm. dual screen variant of right. windows 10 it was supposed to be in the servers neo um yeah it's not not happening uh we don't know where the surface neo is i think because the duo ah. was so poorly received microsoft was like oh, I, that's rough. let's not uh let's not do this just yet um I can under I can understand why, and we we have seen some demos of dual screen PCs from other companies. Again, to me, this feels like folding phones. You are not solving a problem. You are doing this cool tech because you kind of can. You know, it's like, hey, look at that. It's like it's like yeah. a dog walking on two legs. You're like, oh, that's that's funny to see. Um, I don't know if it'll actually uh, solve any problems for anybody or is worth an extra cost or anything. So yeah. 
I think they were exploring something to see what could work, and it sounds like sure. this is them going. We tried, and it's like nearly impossible, and it maybe mm -hmm. too hard to be worth the effort. I don't know, V, if you for were sure. excited for 10x. I really wanted to use the Surface Neo. Just look, just look I just wanted to use the Surface Neo. <laughs> right? I just use My it. God, yeah. like so cute. talk talk about it looks great. Out loud, like this is a thing that I'd actually legitimately want to try, and the fact that I never will kind of <laughs> kills me. I, I wouldn't say never. Way. So they are they are bringing some Windows 10X features, mm. at least some of the ideas, like better app security. Um, I think eventually a better touchscreen keyboard and stuff like that will be rolled into mm. Windows 10 proper. I don't think this means dual screen devices are dead entirely in in the Windows world. It just means mm -hmm. Microsoft is not doing a separate OS variant for it. But man, they just keep failing at this because they announced <laughs> Windows 10 S with the first Surface laptop. And that was supposed to be a lockdown streamlined version of Windows where you could only install apps from the App Store. And it was such a dumb idea because nobody uses Windows like that. So and they had to turn about face pretty quickly, too. Yeah. So again, it seems like rather than launching it and seeing it fail, because they kind of know it probably would, they were like, let's just let's just focus on Windows 10 mm -hmm. and see what we could build with that. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Well, that's it, I think, right? For our little roundup of big mm -hmm. news this week. There's been more. There's more. There's like a There's little bit more. of Qualcomm news, by the way. Snapdragon 778 was announced and new 5G you know, technologies and references, please go to Engadget.com to read that because we don't have the time to tell you all of it today here on this. <laughs> We're already running long as it is, but it's been a big week, people. I'm, I'm glad yeah. you're here with us. Send us some mail. How about that? I, I'd love to get some reader mail. We we'll have some mail we're also going to get yeah. to. Yeah. Eventually, time. eventually. Uh, send us mail at podcastengadget.com. We would love to take your questions in the future. Let's move on to what we've been working on. I... <laughs> I'm just dead. I'm just dead, Trillin. So you tell me, what are you working yes. on? Yes, I. Uh, so just, I'm still playing with the Android 12 beta a little bit. I can, I will continue to update my uh, hands on with it as I learn more things from my experiences and with Google. Um, and I am starting to review a new interesting laptopy thing. I kind of don't want to let people know yet because mm. I don't want people to beat me to the punch. But top priority, <laughs> taking some time off. Next week, I will not be here. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I'm still yeah, waiting yeah. on the <laughs> all clear signal. You don't know. Okay. Nothing big I happening. mean, I, I feel like you're all clear. Uh, there is <laughs> Microsoft be. Build is next week. So thank you, Sherlyn, for running away during that. Uh, we are I would usually help that. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, we will split up the Build news day anyway. Sherlyn needs a break. <laughs> Everybody, please email Sherlyn and tell her to take no. a vacation. Oh, OK, OK. You can do that, yeah. yes. Um, but V, what are you working on? I gotta tell you guys, I'm keeping things loosey goosey for a little while. I might be doing like a <laughs> like a like a roundup of like air tags accessories. So if you have any of those you want me to try out, sure, I'll take a look at mm -hmm. them. Uh, I I think I <laughs> I might write about like the fake Peloton bike that I built for myself, just in yes, case you, you don't want to spend two thousand dollars on a sure. bike. Like, yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, just kind of having a good time for a little while. Feels good. You, yeah, you're gonna help Devendra on build, you know. Yes, I did you. already we'll offer news, before yeah. the show. Hit me up. I got you, bud. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our pop culture picks for the week. Sherlyn, what is your secret? What so you uh, I struggled really, really hard this week, but last minute uh I got a late breaking uh exclusive embargo <laughs> offer from Microsoft. Uh -huh. And basically the company teamed up with Asian media company and record label 88 Rising to generate an AI-based never-ending remix of this thing called Too Many Tears.ai. <laughs> it is it is off of a um yeah, yeah. Uh, singer and rapper Warren Hugh, um, his latest single, Too Many Tears. So basically what Microsoft and 88 Rising have done is take that song um, and then also send out uh, some technical specialists to the San something valley. Oh gosh, I need to get a San Gabriel valley, I want to say. Uh -huh. Let me double check. Um, and then put a camera there, send the 24 seven feet to AI. And the AI is kind of looking at like transitions between sunset, uh, you know, sunrise, dusk and dawn, that sort of thing. And chain using stems from the music to create sort of a musical background to the scenes that are also playing on screen. You can go check this out on too many tears AI. If you want to see I, my, my thing is like Microsoft's whole like collaborations with entertainers, like you know, Warren Hugh and in the uh -huh. past Bjork, by the way, um, mm -hmm. has resulted in these like really interesting musical background music things that you can, now that you're spending so much time at home, just 
put on in the background. I'm going to go do that. And it's, you know, Microsoft also pointed out that the um, this project is part of celebrating Asian uh, American representation, I guess. And, and some of the, mm-hmm. and that Valley, that area is also one of the most diverse um, in the area that Microsoft said. So that's my, one of my Asian shout outs this week, but the other one I wanted to <laughs> shout out, I was like, what am I, what am I going to uh-huh. shout out that is Asian? Because I haven't watched a lot of Asian things recently. Haven't been looking at uh, Asian creators lately. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a throwback to way back when I used to recommend all kinds of crap on this podcast. I'm going to recommend you some Asian food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Please. If you, if you are wondering what to eat this week, or this month, go all Asian. Dude, there's so many different kinds of Asian food: Thai food, Malay food, Indian food. It sounds like you've prepared a book report for a book you haven't read. Charlie, what are you doing? <laughs> Wait, is that your Asian actual bakeries? recommendation? Just, just like get some food for a just, month. Uh, you know, get some food. Get Hot some takeout. Pie. Sichuan, hot pot, dry pot, mm. Asian beers. Ooh, dry beers. Oh, sorry, tiger. Chat. Yeah. <laughs> this is like every non-work conversation with Shirley. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Like as soon as we're off work mode, she's like, "What's? Uh, what are we gonna eat, guys? Like, what is? <laughs> what's happening? Yeah." Anyway, Amazing. that's my pick. Amazing. Asian food. <laughs> Great. All right, I'm gonna. V, I bet you did. You did. The job. You did your you homework. Did, you completed the assignment here. <laughs> I did. Do you I have did. any pop culture yes. recommendations? Call on me. Um, that's yes. more than food. So, oh, I don't know if you guys know this about me. I've basically given up on regular television and most uh-huh. streaming services, just like as a thing. I get the vast majority of all my entertainment from YouTube and the YouTube channel that has ensorcelled me so thoroughly for the past few weeks. And I it really has been a source of great comfort to me as I've been reviewing stuff and just sort of like figuring out stuff about my life is a channel called project farm. And this is a gentleman, Demeter, mm. you might be into this. Yeah. This is a gentleman who among other things tests, you know, what kinds of oil would be best to use in your car? <laughs> what kind of, what kind of drill bits last the longest? Oh, uh, I love those YouTube good for values? like, the little granular things like this, like, oh, I am really excited about drill bits. Yeah. This, this Tell person, me more. this person is incredible. He mm-hmm. just, I, uh, one of my favorite videos, he, he bought a fake Makita, like power, <laughs> like drill power uh-huh. screwdriver thing. And that was 30 bucks and compared it to the actual Makita that it was based on, which is like 130, yep. just like went full out. It's like a 12 minute video. It's, it's like full. drilling until it dies. <laughs> yeah. Just like yeah. which one can drill faster? What's like the cutoff point? Yeah. Uh, he connects them to each other to just like crank both and see which one wins. Obviously, yeah. the real Makita wins. The, I, I cannot begin to impress upon people the the sort of granularity and and just sort of the thoughtfulness of his approach to testing which tape measure is best or which ratchet strap is the best ratchet strap. Yeah. So if you even I, I don't own a home, I don't I'm not a handy person, but I aspire to be one day, maybe. And this guy gives me hope that maybe one day with the right tools that he finds, maybe I'll be good at something. You'll be good at something. Hey, follow, find some YouTubers. Here's the thing. Like the thing about YouTube is that no matter what your interest is, you will find people doing stuff you're into and also weird random things like this that yeah, I get really into as well. So thank you. I, thank you for the shout out, D. I'm gonna talk I'm gonna about, add to my homework. Yeah. Sorry, really quick. Oh, there's God. there's YouTubers <laughs> you who you've already on the F. You follow that. And also, also, uh uh crap, what did I want to say? Oh <laughs> also Mythic Quest season two. That's my homework. Good good job. That's yep. it's out. Go watch. Good job. Okay. Good job. It's out. Um I, I will also be watching that. Mythic Quest is good. Watch it, folks. Um, I'm kind of the old fogey, I guess, who likes shows <laughs> and scripted narrative entertainment, such as movies. Uh, but I want to shout out The Nevers, which aired its mid-season, first season finale this week. Um, I was, I think I talked about this when it first launched. This is Joss Whedon's new thing. It is the most Joss Whedon-y thing to arrive because it's like mixtures of Buffy and Angel and Firefly and everything. Even his comic stuff is in here. Uh, It is a weird show to be talking about now because Whedon is basically nuclear. He's a little toxic because of reports from just how crappy he was as a boss and how he kind of used his influence to uh, to bed people he worked for he worked with. Um, So not great. Not a great dude. He left the show after basically after these episodes and it's being show run by different people now. Um, 
I do want to say though, as a show, it is good. You know, it is very tropey. It is it is very much like things you've seen before with Whedon, but uh, it does some really cool stuff. It is about people in the like Victorian era who some who get powers. When the show was initially pitched, it was actually we thought it was just women getting powers, but it's actually a little more complicated than that. So powers are happening. And then uh, this mid-season finale drops, and it is one of the wildest things I've ever seen on TV. And it actually harkens back to another Whedon project where he does a big surprising thing uh, that's Dollhouse, a show that nobody saw. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think if you like Whedon stuff, if you are into sci-fi uh, and fantasy and you know superhero stuff, it is worth checking out The Nevers. It is definitely worth getting to episode six. And uh, why, why don't you tweet at me when you get there? Tweet at me your reaction because I think it does some really bold and interesting stuff for TV. And I like being surprised by my uh, by my narratives and by the things I watch. So The Nevers season one is good. Don't listen to Rotten Tomatoes because Rotten Tomatoes reviews <laughs> were just the first couple episodes. <laughs> Shaky, sure. It gets really good. I like the cast. I like the characters. And I'll keep watching because, uh, hey, Whedon's not going to be involved anymore. And it, there's a strong cast. There's a strong crew of writers and people working on it, too. So, yeah, I hope the show lives on. Check out The Nevers, everybody. Been meaning to watch it. We'll do it after you've given us such a strong recommendation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, yeah, please tweet at me. Once you get to episode six, once you start episode six, to be honest. I heard a lot of things about that. Once you hit play, yeah. you're like... What is uh, it's going to basically be me and Alex Kranz just uh, just geeking out about what's oh, going no, on. Oh no, you've been with talking it. to her about this. Oh <laughs> no, I, I need to. I, we need to catch up. Oh, we need to do, do a Neverest yeah. chat. Uh, okay. But anyway, that's it for me. Um, I, I have food recommendations. Please eat. Please eat food. <laughs> I mean that. Please I recommend. That. Yeah, please energize yourself. Uh, some good instant noodle brands. Oh How my about god, that? ramen no, brands. Sherlyn, you already <laughs> failed. <laughs> Wait no, if we're doing if we're doing good uh, instant noodle brands, no, okay, mama, fine, get, fine. Get, the, get the duck noodles. You've ruined duck noodles. Food Rex, food Rex, V, go. Mom, mama duck noodles, the mm. sort of like really cheap, like super cheap Thai mama brands really fake good, yeah. duck mama flavored brands noodles. Good. I like the there's the Korean spicy noodle that has like the chicken. Oh, nong shim. Yeah, nong, nong shim. shim. Nice. Yeah, he's uh, it's good. It's too spicy because I have to use like half <laughs> the spice pack because otherwise it's like I can't eat, I can't even eat it. You you you've nong gone shim too is far. Really good. Yeah, it's not the good. crazy, crazy fire uh, spice one. I don't think that one's another one. Sanyang, <sighs> I think. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, my favorite are Prima. Prima does good Singaporean laksa. We're talking about this on mm -hmm. the uh, chat. Um, and uh, Maggie. I like Maggie a lot. Miojo is another really good one with the sesame oil. So here you go. Asian ramen noodle <laughs> brand. Wait, right. one, there's... More. one more. Yeah. Migo, yeah. Migo Rang, the sort of Indian Migo Rang's garlic good. noodles. Delicious. I've got a box it's all good. Of them hey, the, the there, amazing hey. thing is you can get good noodles no matter where you are now. Uh, even if you don't yeah. live near a store that carries these things which even major grocery stores do you could get good uh good noodles on amazon or something so get them have some noodles in the background uh happy lunch everybody i think we're all really hungry can you tell <laughs> you can wrap it up shortly oh yeah let's hit that outro yeah well that's it for our episode everyone thank you as always for listening our theme music is by game composer dale north our outro music is by our very own Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find Devendra online at... At Devendra on Twitter and at the Slash Filmcast at SlashFilm.com. And if you need him, Chris Velasco is online at... You can find me at Chris Velasco on Twitter or you can email me at V at Engadget.com. Mm. Or waiting in line for the next three thousand dollar Apple product, right? No, shut up. I'm yeah. now on Amazon yeah. buying more duck noodles. So yeah. Oh no. Better or cheaper. At an Apple store. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to send me your questions <laughs> about Asian food in general, because clearly I'm such an expert now, uh, I am at Sherlyn Lowe on Twitter. Email us your thoughts, questions, and feedback at podcast.engadget.com. Leave us a review, please, on iTunes and subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Okay, Woo! we're clear. So we've got uh, actually the the um, chat for most of that was really just talk like people were talking about getting really vaccines did. because oh, Sherlyn was telling people to get vaccinated. I'm gonna run um, to the bathroom. You guys have fun. I'm sure it'll be yeah. more food. Stuff. Okay, right. sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, talking about 88 Rising, like yes, definitely. Like 88 Rising is just a cool label. Um, uh, Joji on it. 
the former filthy filthy frank um <laughs> oh yeah uh like dumbfounded um rich brian like okay he's got you know his own baggage but whatever um uh yeji has done a uh release on there she makes pretty cool house music um deb never I think Deb Never is really cool. Uh, she's like Brockhampton affiliated. If anybody in the chat knows about Brockhampton, I don't know if you guys are Zoomers. Um, and uh, the only thing that, the only other thing that I have to say about 88 Rising is that I just imagine that like a ton of F boys work there. Like that's just how it works. <laughs> okay. What, what about them gives you that impression? Um, mostly like the, the guys who say that they're really into Joji are like, they say that they're loveless, but they're actually heartbreakers. That's what I'm basing this okay. on. Okay. That's a fair read. Um, um, since we have a little bit of time, I hope, uh, I kind of want to shout out just all the frequent names that have been back today. Uh, all the regulars, Kea Sante, by the way, is now officially a Chris Dan. So, oi. yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll say the digital ones came. Uh, I know Ray Exception <laughs> and Mark Dell both here. Uh, as always, true. I recommended so no, no, no. I mean, good You're for you. Like that You're those like him, sound good. The Tom Yum noodles are also really good on under the mommy brand. Drew Carmokar, another uh, a regular or familiar name. And I saw Bryant Mitchell, Jedi Mind Trick on you. Uh, we all, Pat Kilo is also a regular. Uh, we, we, we didn't see I Can Poop Twice a Day yay today. No, no. Poop, <laughs> poop Twice a Day checked in, but I'm not sure that oh. uh, they, they stuck missed around. The food chat. They missed the food chat. Oh, yeah. they had to go to <laughs> well, get rid of the food. Because if, if you're trying to poop twice a day, you need a lot of food. Yeah, <laughs> you, you do food. need a lot of food. Gonzalo Costa uh, yeah. <laughs> does sound like a, I believe is a regular too. Varuna Singh might be new. I'm not sure if you uh, have been here before, but hi. Chris Angelo Perez. Lots. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying. There's lots of you today. Jonathan Anderson uh we we see you we're glad you're all coming back and i feel like our little community is growing hmm, I, think I think so and a growing community nice. needs food which is why i recommend indomie me goreng noodles indomie <laughs> is really good because this because is not, not sponsored not, this, this is, is not, not none, of, none of this talk is sponsored just fyi we just not love sponsored. Stomach, asian food my, my basement yeah. is just also my pantry Okay, yep. but I do I do have um, a special YouTube only uh, pick uh, that is also mm -hmm. AAPI related video. Can you uh, bring up that? Yes. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> in the last few weeks, I've been watching this guy, Chief Macoy. Um, oh, he is he, he's on YouTube. He is a um, chief engineer on a big shipping vessel, like container oh, ship, dang. and mm, nice, he. Nice. He does such good analysis of like just the Boat global news. shipping, and <laughs> so like what? Yes, so when, um, like yeah. his the his like canal time, boat. yes, yeah. yes, his time to shine was when the big <laughs> boat got stuck, and um, he did uh, such good like yeah. almost daily um uh um like updates, which is surprising because he must have not been at sea at that point. Um, also, if you just like watch some of his more normal videos, he'll talk about what it's like to be a ship's cook. He'll talk about like what it's like to actually do his job, the process of like getting his job, the fact that so many Filipinos are seafarers because that's a way of making mm -hmm. like a yep. lot of money in a different yep. currency outside of like Philippines, uh, the Philippines natu national currency. This guy is a diarist. He's just a really good writer. And it's good. Uh, so I, I really like him um, and uh, I think that he deserves a little bit more um, attention even though like a lot of his videos you know they'll average in at least the low hundreds of thousands of views that's um, pretty good Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to do is personally like make a retirement fund for him if he wants to leave the seafaring industry he could just be like He's probably YouTube seafaring probably analyst. doing really well uh, <laughs> what, what, my my sad the saddest thing is like when you see good youtubers who are not getting any hits and like I just mm, I wish I could help pump up this channel yeah <sighs> so, uh quickly I saw day. a question sorry okay. that I wanted to address no, I'm not ahead. sure if you were done Ben no go ahead okay. go ahead 
Um, final two shout outs to Danny Leong, also a recurring name, as well as Will So that we've seen before. The question comes from Jacob Strixma, I believe. Uh, let us know how you pronounce your name. <laughs> um, any updates of Talkback and Brailleback? I believe this is continued uh, discussion on that accessibility topic from IO. Uh, so nothing specifically shouted out on t- in terms of Talkback and Brailleback. But uh, yeah, stick around. So I believe they'll continue to make... We've got cat on stream. We've got cat on stream alert. Look at the cat. Here. Okay. So, but I didn't want to step on the the end of that (gasps) answer, Sherlock. You beauty. No worries. I think I'm done there. All right. Any questions for the cat? (laughs) Meow, 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 meow. Oh my gosh. I sound like that person on Kitchen Nightmares. Anyway. Dad, is that a a Himalayan or something? No. She's like some sort of Siamese mix, I think. She's so cute. She's very cute. Varuna Singh says, this sounds great, and they subscribed. Hallelujah, thank you. Thanks for subscribing, whether it is to the podcast or to our YouTube. I don't really know to which everything. one. Oh, well, uh, well, yeah, or uh, maybe it was the uh, Seafarer was the guy. Cat. But like, if... Oh, <laughs> that- <laughs> yeah. But if you subscribe to the Seafarer that I suggested, because I suggested it, you should subscribe to the Engadget podcast. Please. Leave us a review on iTunes. I'm going to say it again, but seriously, just leave a review on iTunes. It's yeah. really easy to do, and it helps like in, in an excise not excise but it like it helps an outsized amount for the amount for sure. of work that you put in also subscribe to our youtube channel because then you'll know when we're going live and you'll be among the first to know yeah to get more uh, <clears throat> hot asian food recommendations you know yeah just the fact that asian food exists yeah it just <laughs> it exists hey by the, everybody should just have noodles you should just have noodles in the background because if you want to do something with leftovers Turns out, just making some instant noodles and throwing some leftover chicken or something on it mm-hmm. is the best thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, eggs, or even eggs, all kinds of noodles. <laughs> whatever. Whatever. You whatever. Want, yeah, whatever you want. You really, so really good. Italian noodles. You're like yeah. egg. You could put. Uh, yeah. So Ray Exception um, is asking Devendra, "What is the cat's mm-hmm. name?" Cat's name is Coco. Hi, Coco. Oh, Coco. Coco. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> Gonzalo Costa asks, "How many people are there at Engadget?" Um, there are uh, not enough. Not, not yeah. enough. Definitely not enough. not enough. I think editorial. Yeah. There's like fifteen well, of us, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe fifteen of us. And that's actually an interesting thing that like should mm-hmm. be talked about more. Like mm-hmm. people kind of assume your favorite website, your favorite news source, or whatever. Um, especially if it's a blog. You know, if it isn't like the New York Times or anything mm-hmm. like that, it is probably smaller than you think. Yep. Just full stop. Or if it's not a huge we, site I like mean, CNET or something, you know. But, right. You know. We're lucky, though. We have, like, support on video. I mean, we have a like, very lean video team art, like, in Gadget itself. But we do have, like, Verizon Media, which is soon going to be called Yahoo, which used to be, like, oh. Anyway, uh, you know, we have, like, an in-house video team that is currently streaming this broadcast to you right now. They're taking care of the stuff behind the scenes for us. We've, we, we will thank them shortly. I know that uh, Ben plans to do the credits. But hey, you know, producers we're lucky thank to have producers. That yeah, thank producers. Yeah. Thank everybody. Um, thank your pets for keeping us sane. Uh, yeah, the eat, people in the chat are making eggs. cat noises. There are cat emojis. Uh, meow. Um, people are talking. Oh, uh, Wilso just like mentions uh, having fried plantains. I've had oh, plantains, plantains around a lot. Mm, um, yeah, like mm-hmm. I I am very thankful to my uh, friend in middle school um, who introduced me to platanos because mm-hmm. um, that was not something that my family usually ate. And so mm-hmm. like I, I seek them out. The problem is you got to get the maduros. You got to get the like, you know, uh, plantains that are closer to being black than yep. anything because just, that's no, when they get them like, you way just sweeter them, you, you just get. let them sit for yeah, maybe right, right, weeks right. Yeah. it takes yep. a while sometimes do you, guys, do you guys do sugar with your fried plantains or not nah? that's hmm. cheating is that that's cheating. <laughs> it should be it should be naturally <laughs> sugared yeah i do fried yeah. bananas i'm sorry goring pizza it's the same it's the same basic idea yeah, yeah. one of the things but that goring i want to try a lot sweeter is that Filipino thing where you have avocado and then also like mm. sweetened condensed milk, I think. I have never, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm, I swear to you that this wow. is a thing. Am I the bad Filipino? I mean, I can't rule that out. Have you even been, have you been to the Filipino restaurant that is five yes. minutes from UV? I have, I have been to Purple oh. Yam. I like Purple Yam. It's Purple a little Yam's Americanized, great. but it's very it's good. Little, if you yeah. live in the sort of Flatbush, Ditmas Park area of Brooklyn, go oh, support man. Purple Yam. Purple Yam, they have okay, really you, good chicken adobo. So I really appreciate that. I, I, I okay. 
oh, it's actually avocado and milk in ice. It's I that, drink that. That's, I drink been, that. that's been an I've Asian drink for yeah. a while. Um, yeah. My mom used to, when I was like, what, 14, love avocado milkshake. They used to do that at yeah. the store. Yep, yep. I, so so I looked pure it up fat milkshake. To, like, okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> I looked it up milkshake. just to like verify that, it, you know, whether or not it, the provenance is specifically from uh -huh. the Philippines. And it seems like it may be the greater Southeast Asian area. Mm -hmm. So like I saw some recipes from uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, this specific thing that I'm talking about is is avocados, uh, powdered milk, not sweetened condensed milk. Excuse me. Powdered milk is good. Um, yeah. Sugar and just ice cubes. This is not like a milkshake. This is literally just ice cubes. Because it will melt instantly. So it becomes like a slushy thing. Basically. Yeah, it, it itself has yeah. like that creamy quality probably. That's yep. why it doesn't need too much more mm -hmm. milk and it just needs liquids. Um, mm -hmm. I think I saw, uh, I think Wilso said, you just love to travel with us. We seem like fun to travel with. That's why we love going on shows. I think it's fun to just travel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a team um also eat a lot also asian food <laughs> it's better to travel <laughs> on your own and then meet up as a team how about that <laughs> i like that, that. well <laughs> i would say yeah we even go to berlin and have asian food in berlin yeah so. yeah which yeah. is surprisingly good we've had some good stuff there i hope everybody has a good lunch today <laughs> <laughs> good lunch uh, ube is live doc rock says ube is live people hell yeah, yes. absolutely delicious. although i'm not a, i've never been a big ube fan I'm a slow, it's... like a slow warming up to that. You're not User having the hit... right ube ice cream is the problem. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, there's it. so many, there are bugs in my power. room right now for some reason. Oh, like no. it's getting warmer in the New York area. Yep. I said in the chat that I didn't know earwigs can fly until I saw one flying past my face just a few minutes ago. <laughs> um, happy that that we was are, not we... on the stream and my reaction was not on the stream. <laughs> As Chat? much as I'd like to continue, though, I think we're like what five minutes. Yeah, from yeah, we're, we're yeah, we're, we're about five minutes from thank where you, we need folks. to end. So. Thank you to everyone in the chat. The stream comes to you via our video team. Kyle Mock is the leader of the video team, but he is off this week, but we still thank him. Owen Davinoff. Coco. <laughs> Coco the cat. Uh, Julio Barrientos and Luke Brooks. So uh, Coco is not usually a video team member, but Owen Davidoff, Julio Barrientos, and Luke Brooks round out the video team. It is powered by everyone in the chat. We had such fun talking to everyone in the chat. Um, come back next time. Um, seriously, Thank you, you folks, are the yeah. people who uh, like make this recording what it is. I, I think there's more energy because of it. If you've stuck around this long, rate us in iTunes. Again, it is a little bit of work for you, but it does a lot of good for our ranking in the general one algorithms thing. One sentence. Yeah, one one need. sentence. Five star rating. You do it. <laughs> you do it in Uber. Everyone knows to do five star rating in Uber, yeah. just because like that's how drivers don't get fired. Uh, five star rate the podcast because you know better than the average person, you and gadget reader, that do it for the cat. Yeah, that do algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that face. Algorithms control our lives in really silly ways. So just help us out with the algorithms. Come on. And we'll see you next week. Uh, Good night. Thank y'all. Bye. Bye.